Haley Ramsey is an archaeologist, an author, a global explorer, and we sit down and talk about her brand new book, The Bringers of Life, The Cosmic History of the Divine Feminine, as well as all of her archaeological experiences, her time all over the planet, her connection to the Divine Feminine, Freemasonry, the Knights Templar, the Goddess Lore, ancient megalithic sites, and everything in between. We had a really great time. This is the first time we actually talked, and it's not going to be the last. So thanks again. Um... For doing this. this is awesome i appreciate you taking time out to uh, talk with me i'm just a dude yeah. so um, thank you for having me yeah to- totally totally um so let's talk about you this book that i mean i don't know how i stumbled upon you i, I don't know if i was being creepy and weird and, and i found something with scott walter and i saw you and i was like hey who's this and then i googled your name and then i saw the the cover of your book and i was like holy crap like everything that i've been researching for the past few years and then forever really <laughs> it all came together like on the cover of your book and, I'm, and we're going to show it here but it's like wow like who did that cover art did you do that i mean it's amazing whoever it's awesome you know i, I can write but i can't i can't I'm not i don't have any artistic talent whatsoever aside from <laughs> writing so i actually contacted me on upwork and i kind of told them what i wanted and i sent them some sample pictures and i said here's this here's this throw it all on a cover and make it good and so they did a really good job with that. So. Yeah, super rad. It's just awesome. I mean, just everything in there. I mean, first of all, since I'm a Freemason, I see the square and compass and I'm like, oh, wow, I see the number 13. I mean, obviously I see the lady, you know, the mother, the goddess. Uh, then I see a Templar mm-hmm. ship and I'm like, oh my God, why, how is this, any, can this get any more amazing? You know, like, you know, and then I'm like, I got to read this book. And I'm like, I got to find this book. I got to find it. I got to find it. Then I found you on Twitter. And I'm hitting you up in your DMs and I'm like, hey, where can I buy your book? And you're like, it's almost done. <laughs> yeah, so, there's just so much going on and I had other things going on. I actually did travel a lot during the pandemic. I probably yeah. saw more of this country in the last year than I've ever seen in my entire existence. Cool. Which has kind of been a blessing. And I had actually gotten a job where I was doing freelance writing and I was able to do that and work from anywhere. Nice. So that, you know, that was just a bonus. So I could just travel and work and yeah, it was great. And, you know, the, the cover of my book obviously has all of the elements of, you know, what is inside the book and the content of the book and what it boils down to. And that's all um, going back to the sacred feminine and the connections that, you know, the sacred feminine has throughout history and society. Yeah, it's amazing. And and how did you get interested in that? I mean, to, to begin with, I mean, your, your, your background's uh, archaeology, right? Am I, or am, I, am I wrong? Is it Yes, that's what I've been studying is archaeology in school, yes. Okay, cool, cool. So you're, you haven't graduated yet? You're on your way there? You're almost done? I have not, yes. I have one more year, and then I will be an archaeologist with a degree. Yay, that's cool. Don't, 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 um, don't give up. I mean, it, I was... I was 20, 28 when I went back to college and I was like the old guy, right? So I, when I was in college, everybody was like 19 yeah. and I was, a, I was the guy getting asked to buy beer all the time, right? So, you know, if I did it, anybody can do it. I can tell you that. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the other thing that I do is actually tours, and I give tours overseas. And I had just started up a tour company prior to the pandemic starting. Literally in November of 2019, I had gone to Scotland, was in the process of moving there, getting set up. You know, I kind of just started doing day tours of people that you know, t- people that were visiting, and I was staying actually at Dalhousie Castle, wow. which is the home of. And they had, you know, basically agreed to put me up for a few months. And we worked out a deal where when people would, you know, check in during the daytime, they had the the option to book tours for, you know, their stay with me, which was really great. So every day I'd run down and check my diary and see if I had tours to do. And that was kind of a great start and a great way to feel out the business over there. And it just immediately took off. And I was actually giving tours to sites associated with the Knights Templar and the Grail Legends, Roslyn, of course, you know, that kind of thing. And everybody loves the Da Vinci Code. They just ate that up. And so it was really cool to actually take people to the places they filmed, but actually, you know, the research and the strong historic ties that Roslyn has with the Templars and Freemasons and the Royal Bloodline. It's incredible. And so that was just really fun. And it was really unique because no one else that I know of in Scotland has been doing Grail tours. I've seen over in France, I actually went on a few tours with some awesome researchers over there but not in Scotland. So that was kind of fun and different. And that's kind of what I'm working on getting back to now, hoping to go back this summer, maybe early fall. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So my wife is a huge fan of uh, Outlander, the TV show, the series Uh, and the books. (laughs) Yeah. 
so actually I'm a, you know, the other thing that I really am fascinated with is Jacobite history. So I'm actually yeah. working on an Outlander package that we're going to be visiting all of the sites that they filmed at for Outlander. Nice. And let me tell you, it's some really cool places. And I visited some of the film sites, like the site where Claire goes through the stones. Yeah. And that it, it was amazing to me because that site they picked was so desolate. I was driving out there and this was in last year in February. When I get out there, it's just all country in the highlands. And this road is so narrow and the, what's paved is pretty rough and covered in ice. And there's just, you know, <laughs> random wild animals just walking across the, <laughs> the road. So it was pretty, it was, I, I got out there and actually ran into the farmer who gave me a ride back down to my car when wow. I hiked out to the site because it's private property. But the fun thing in Scotland is there's no such thing as trespassing. Really? So once you have property, you can go wherever you want. You know, there's no such thing as trespassing. So mm. I got out to the film site and it starts snowing really bad. And I start walking back to my car and there's all these sheep running around and uh, the farmer comes up and I said, oh, hi, you know, and he asked me, you know, what I was doing. And I told him. I was visiting and he goes, oh, I, you know, he starts talking about the site. And I said, how did they even find this location to right. film? Yeah. And he said to me, he said, oh, well, they send scouts out all over Scotland and drive these back roads. And I thought, well, that, that sounds like a fun job to yeah, have. Yeah, totally. Let me just <laughs> randomly get lost. In, so were there actually those stones there? Are they there in that formation from no. the show? Okay. They are not. They are actually, the, the stones are made out of styrofoam and cardboard and they're painted. <laughs> and they they actually took the the model of the stone circle from, I think, the, the Cavendish Stone Circle, I believe. But it, okay. was, it was modeled after another famous stone circle in Scotland. Nice. But yeah, you would think they look, they look completely real. You get out there and the site itself was an Iron Age ring fort. Wow. So there's history going back to like 1000 BC or so. Wow, that's awesome! Yeah, I was just yeah, I, t I told my wife that, and she's like, "Oh my god!" And it's like she's usually about me doing the stuff. She's like, "Oh, my, you got to go down there and you got to talk to somebody again." And I'm like, "Look, you know what? Haley does this thing in Scotland where she's like, okay, 'Okay, I'm game.' <laughs> she's like, go talk to her, go figure it out.' Yeah. I want to, I want to go. I'm like, okay, cool. Maybe I'll put in a good word. Maybe we can go over there. Um, I've just been recently doing some genealogy, and I found out I have some ancestry in Scotland. It actually, goes way back, and then Ireland as well, and that whole area. So interest totally interested to see how that goes um for me and i'm like oh, that's pretty cool it's always seems like a magical mystical kind of place and i've always wanted it, to go it really is you have to go and you should definitely come on one of my tours i've got to go you on know, your tour. I, I think you really enjoy it. yes you guys both have to come you can come do a you know night templar tour and the outlander tour if you're but yeah. it, it's it's a fantastic place and i'm curious obviously I, my name's ramsey so my yeah. family goes back to clan I also have ties to the St. Clairs. The Ramseys and the St. Clairs were only a few miles apart, and there is tons of intermarriage there. Right. Uh, and the Stewarts. Mary, Queen of Scots, is actually my like tenth cousin wow. back. Tenth for yeah, she, ten generations back. She was my first cousin, I believe. That's so awesome. So, what are your ties? Well, I'm, I'm just got into it. I just actually a few weeks ago sent in my DNA. So I was like, I got really far up, and then I was like, I want to just see what happens. You know, at first I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to give somebody my DNA, but I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'm already on 400 lists. They already know where I am, and they're listening to me all the time anyway. <laughs> give them my DNA. Yeah. But why not just give them my DNA? But um, yeah, so um, Donahue, and it goes back to um, uh, oh geez, so um, well this guy. Uh, it's funny. Uh, there's this um, Banks, 1840, 1849 came to America. This is my great, 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 great grandpa. Oh, how cool. Yeah, this picture was taken in the 1800s or something like that. I mean, obviously, it's a copy, but this guy died in 1877. And I'm thinking, well, that's kind of cool then. I mean, but yeah, so Banks and Donahue and... Um, um, Rinders and there's a bunch of German that's mixed in there too. And somehow it goes into Scotland and, and it gets kind of weavy in there. That's when it, but Banks, I think came from that side and then, and then the Irish side as well. So I'm still trying to sort it all out. It's a big kind of tangled web, especially the way records are. It's a lot of, um, of, um, uh, church records, obviously for the time that were kept. So trying to dig that all out and uh, trying to figure it out. But yeah, once I found that out, I was just like, wow, you know, Majorowski, my dad's Polish forever. And that's just the way that goes. But my mom's side is that whole cool Irish, Scottish, uh, you know, German fun stuff over there. <laughs> so excited. Well, have you to, ever been over there? Ireland not, or Scotland? I have no. not. I have not. I've always, I've always like been like, eh, you know, um, but before with Poland, my wife was always like, let's go to Poland. I'm like, my, you know, my dad told me that they, because I'm like the third generation from my dad's side in America. And he's like, they fought for everything they could to get out of Poland to come here. I'm like, why do I want to go back? To, like, they did everything they could yeah. to get here. I'm like, I want to go right back. I'm like, I don't know. They had a reason to come here. It's probably not that cool. <laughs> That's my two cents. I don't know. But 
Yeah, I would definitely want to check that out. So I'm, I'm going to take you up on it next time. That, uh, I'm totally going to hit you up and we're going to do the tour because there's so much Masonic history there too. I mean, the Scottish Rite, all of that stuff, obviously, obviously kind of started all off there, you know. Um, well, yeah. Lodge Zero is, I believe, over on the Western coast. Yeah, and and it's still standing, I think, from what I understand. The actual physical building is still there from where they met, and I, I can't remember the year. So, um, yeah, I'm really pumped to see that. I, I really like to go check that out. But, um, you know, I was hoping that, uh, you know, all of the, because I fell into Outlander at first. I was like, I don't know if I want to watch a show. My wife was like, no, you got to watch it because I fell into history. And then fell into Outlander. Yeah, I fell into Outlander. I can't believe it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it. I don't care. I did. And then she started, you know, she read all the books as well. And then she told me the books as, you know, the characters are actually Freemasons. You know, there's some Freemasonry in the books as well. Like Jamie, Jamie the main character, yes. you know, he's a Freemason. And, right. You know, and there's um, some other stuff in there. I think I can't remember if, you know, his uh, godfather, I think is, um, and I can't remember that guy's name. Uh, but yeah, and they kind of was in prison and, you know, they were Masons and they kind of met up and had like their own lodge in prison and stuff. And so it was pretty cool because, you know, we're, she's reading. I'm like, OK, fine. Now I have to figure this out. <laughs> I'll watch it now. Yeah. <laughs> it's not just some yeah, hokey no, dude you want to watch. In the show, they don't really talk about it as much as they do in the books. Not so at it's all. It's kind of a shame because they get into that. And like they when they're in America, you know, they 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 tell Jamie, hey, there's another Freemason here we want you to meet. And it ends up being George Washington. Yeah. And that's it, though. It's just like, oh, hey, Jamie's a Freemason. No, that's how you introduce it, that George Washington's here. OK, cool. Hey, brother. Yeah. <laughs> there have been so many plot lines and twists, that whole thing. But no, totally. Sorry, we have on a crazy sidetrack, but this is all relative, yeah. man. I, I, you know, that you graciously sent me like the first hundred pages of your book. I read it twice because I loved every second of it. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm so glad. It's so awesome. There's so many cool things. How did how did you start on the Divine Feminine? How did you figure this out? How did you go like this is something? And oh my God, I want to write about this. Well, I have to say, I think that you know, going back, I, I was raised Episcopal and Catholic. And I never really, I had too many questions about the religion. And every time I would go to the priest, he would just tell me, well, you can't question it. it you just have to have faith. <laughs> and I just, I, there's so many questions I had about creation. And I, I was like a five-year-old going to the priest saying, well, if, if God just existed, who created God? And I always thought it didn't make sense that God existed. There had to be some kind of feminine, you know, source of birth in the universe and the cosmos. Right, right, right. right. There was a feminine you know force or just some kind of energetical force um you know I, I just thought it was really intriguing my whole life that everybody just believed god just popped into existence someday and he definitely that, that's never happened in the history of ever like and neither has a virgin birth ever been witnessed you know so I, there's just so many things that didn't make sense for me that i wanted to dive deeper into it and when i did i had started doing this research into the knights templar oh, actually yeah. started my senior year of high school and I was really bored and I had all these blow off classes because my school did this thing where they used to let kids leave early that had, you know, finished their school earlier in the day. I had all my main classes at the beginning, but then in the afternoon, uh, people usually could just leave. But yeah. like the year I was a senior, they did that. So of course uh, I'm stuck in there in these blow off classes, literally doing nothing. So I started watching documentaries on History Channel for fun, you know, when I was nice. in these classes. And I came across Knights Templar documentaries and then the Grail legends. And I thought, what is this? And the more I learned about the, the legend of the Grail and the Holy Bloodline, I started going back into it and I just couldn't stop. It was just, I was so hungry for more. And at the root of it all was the goddess, the sacred feminine. She was what was being protected. She was what was being veiled. And, you know, for, for her own reasons, and today's a great day to be talking about this since it's Mother's Day. You know, it is Mother's Day. Day so, it I is. mean, it just it was so fascinating to me that, especially the Templars, at, at the heart of Templarism, their, their reverence was not for Jesus. And it wasn't really, I mean, it was kind of for John the Baptist, you know, they, they did respect John the Baptist. And they usually, they had the Baphomet, which I believe, um, you know, was the head of John the Baptist that they also used in ritual. Mm -hmm. uh, but their temples were all dedicated to the Virgin Mary, or in France, a lot of them dedicated to Mary Magdalene. Right, right. Which... I mean, so you, go into, you go into some really great stuff about Mary Magdalene in your book. I thought it was really fascinating. And I've, I've done a lot of research as well, but I love the way you weaved it in there. So, I mean, I think it's so great because if you go, I mean, you go back to the beginning of time, it, it's, it, it's to me, it's the same thing, just in another name and in, in, in another era and another veil. And it's, it's gone on since forever. Right. And then that's just my interpretation. And now, I mean, through ufology and all the things that, that are happening now, you know, I got, um, really turned on to it with the Chris Bledsoe story uh, and, you know, uh, the white lady appeared to him and that kind of turned me into, 
you know, the Lakota, uh, the, the white buffalo calf woman, mm-hmm. Fatima, you know, if you think about Fatima and you go back to all that and it's like, this is all the same thing. This is, this is right. not, this is not separate. This isn't, you know, happening in different things and it's not a Catholic thing. It's not a whatever Protestant, you know, it's not a UFO thing. This is a, this is something and it's, and it's connected to the earth, you know, um, Absolutely. And, and us in a way, you know, and I always thought that, that Masons had a part to play in it in some way, you know, when I became a Mason, I mean, I've always been UFOs my whole life, but when I became a Mason, I was like, wow, there's gotta be something. I mean, there's definitely some kind of spirituality or something attached to this whole thing. And, and that's kind of been my quest to kind of figure out, you know, find other Masons, find other brothers, find, you know, other connections to the sacred knowledge, to the divine feminine and, and figure out what's really going on. <laughs> and, it right. led me to, and it led me to you. Thank you, by the way. Thank you for finding me and yeah. for sliding into my DMs and asking me to do this. This is great. But the, um, the UFO connection is an interesting connection because going back to the Templars and even to the first century Jews, they had documents documenting the sky people and the lands in the sky and different documents that talked about other worlds, basically outside of our world. And it's really amazing that all this knowledge has either been, I wouldn't say lost over time, but it's been hidden and kept safe. I would say Mm -hmm. Uh, it's very valuable knowledge and information, obviously, but I think it's really incredible that we have people in the tradition going back that far that we're protecting that information and we're aware of it. And it leads me to believe that that technology existed to travel to other worlds back then as well. Right. I mean, you know, the thing that keeps coming up lately is portals, you know, or, or, Mm -hmm. or, you know, different um, archeological structures or or different places on the planet where the veil is thinner or, or whatever I'm, you know, using words that kind of try to give the idea what's going on, but basically you could travel from one world to the next or one dimension to the next. And there's these sacred places. And sometimes we stumble upon them, you know, and a lot of them are the places that we, these texts are found or, or places that we can't explain like Puma Bunku and, you know, all these amazing places all over the planet that are like, why are these here? They're still finding them in, in Ireland to this day. It was like a month ago, they came across another, you know, tomb is what they always call them, right? It was a mound, but, you know, untouched for thousands of years. And it's like, they're there everywhere, you know? Yeah. The crazy thing over there is literally in Scotland, you know, and in Ireland too, you can just be driving through a neighborhood and in a nice little neighborhood, there's just a random stone circle in someone's front yard, you know, and it's not protected stone circles they are just randomly in people's properties. And one time my friend Ashley was there with me and this was last February and we're just driving down a country road, minding our own business. And there's this big farm that we're passing with all these cows out. And the cows had started to move. I think it was about feeding time. And as they started to clear out, we're driving. I see this massive tomb-like structure. And, you know, in Scotland, it's there's no such thing as trespassing. So I was almost tempted to jump the fence and run over there. But it was a wire fence and I wasn't about to do that. <laughs> but it was just <laughs> just it's raw it's just it's just been there and no one's it's not a site you have to pay to get into i mean it's just stuff you'd only know about if you live locally or you own the property i mean it's amazing that they're just littering the lands those ancient sites which i think is so cool and how are the how are how are the people there that live there's relationship to those things are they just kind of like yeah it's the stone thing or they do they do they have some type of reverence or, or appreciation for it that's a tough question because i've met i've met many people that kind of just pass it by like it's an everyday thing they live there so it's not really a big deal to them right there's other people that live there they're very passionate about history and about these sites and the ancestors that lived there and i find that you know there's few people that really get into it but Mm -hmm. i've definitely noticed always the older people like the local people i gave tours to i wouldn't say local but the scots or the the british people that i had given tours to yeah you know they really enjoy it but they are mostly all older couples and you know people that that came on the trip i would say older is in probably over 60 yeah. and but they, they appreciate the site i mean there's many young people i've met from america that appreciate ancient history like that but i don't know i guess when you're raised around it it doesn't seem as important you know yeah so yeah. and someone yeah no it, totally. around it all the time yeah, it's just like whatever, you know. Like I live on a golf course and I don't golf. My friends are like, "Dude, like, you yeah. just golf anytime you want." I'm like, "Cool." I, don't just, <laughs> I got a friend that lives on a lake and he doesn't fish. He literally, literally, Lake Erie is his backyard. He doesn't even own a fishing pole. I'm like, "Dude, you could fish out your back door." He's like, "Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't fish." So it's the same kind of thing, right? There's an ancient portal yeah, in your I, backyard or something. Ah, eh, whatever. It's been there. <laughs> it's just, and the same thing. I, I get that. I, I grew up in on an island down in South Texas. And I never fished in the entire, like, 
I don't know how many years I lived there, maybe six years I lived there. I never went fishing and I lived at the beach. So. <laughs> it's, a, it's, just, it. it's just the way it is all over the world then. That's cool. I didn't know the, that thing about um, not trespassing in Scotland. So that's going to be dangerous now. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Because, <laughs> you know, I've, I've actually, I wouldn't say I've gotten into lots of trouble, but I've gotten into some, you know, uh, interesting situations going to see different places on different properties and and te- from texas where if you trespass you're likely going to get shot shot you know? yeah <laughs> <laughs> it, there it felt so wrong you know i climb over a fence or there's usually gates you usually don't have to climb fences people usually just have gates and there's lots of paths that you know people walk everywhere so there's paths you can just walk through someone's property and so I had gone and, you know, I went through a glen that led me out to a pasture and I was looking for some for some site that I'd heard about from a local. And it, it felt really wrong, but it was really fun, too, because <laughs> it was exciting. It was off the beaten path. It wasn't something that, you know, people go to usually. Yeah. So it was really neat. And that actually happened when I went to Temple Church near uh, Roslyn. Yeah. And the lands actually belonged to the St. Clairs at one point, mm. but then it became, um, it was a, before that or after that they were granted to the Templars and there was a round temple there, which is, has been totally knocked down. And now it's, it was reformed in like the 1600s or earlier, I believe. Mm. And now it's just a rectangular church and the ruins of that are there, but it was a Templar graveyard. Wow. So there are tons of old, old stones there, tombstones that are you know, beautifully intricate, but a lot of them are starting to fade and there's not protection for them, of course, because they're just out in the wow. elements, but it's, it's really cool. So when I was there, I had actually gone down into the Glen and it was because the, the graveyard and the church are situated right on the river. Oh, okay. and it's a really beautiful area. So, and, and that was, that's one of the stops of my tours. There's not much to see there, but down the road from there, closer to the village there in, in the field next to a house, there is the remnants of an archway that used to be the entrance into the Templar's house. Wow. Which is pretty. That's rad. It's so, so, so rich in history there. It's amazing. And the Templars get, you know, they get such a bad rap, you know, I mean, it's just a huge deal. I mean, um, you know, especially for Freemasons and everything, you know, uh, well, you know, everybody knows how how everything went down and people got burned at the stake (laughs) for heresy and, you know, it was just a, a horrible, horrible deal, but um, that's the way it was. It's all about money when it comes all down to it, unfortunately. But a lot of us are still alive today. Um, Scott Walter, your friends with Scott Walter, I, I believe, you know, obviously at Mason, uh, Templar, amazing guy mm-hmm. does, uh, all kinds of amazing research. I don't know. how did you hook up with Scott? How do you know Scott? How did that whole thing shake out? So I met him actually, because I'd obviously read his work, right? Mm-hmm. Seen his show. And I was driving through Minnesota. I had gone to, to a Lakota Sundance, actually. Mm-hmm. And I was invited by a family called the Black Elks. And actually, their ancestor was a very prominent figure in uh, activism named um, Nicholas Black Elk. And so they had invited me out to Sundance. And I was coming to be a supporter, not to dance, because you you know it's, it's a really big commitment to dance. But I had gone there as a supporter, and I'd gotten to be a part of it, which was really amazing. And I stayed out there for about a week. Cool. And I had driven from Ohio and I was right. actually staying in Ohio at the time. So I was driving back from South Dakota to Ohio and I went through Minnesota because there was a gentleman that reached out to me that had seen my work, my, some of my write-ups on some, I think artifacts from America Stonehenge. And he mm-hmm. wanted me to look at some artifacts he had. They were Egyptian in nature and they'd been dug up in Florida or something to that effect. Wow. And so he wanted me to take a look at them. And so I said, okay. And it was just in Minneapolis. So I actually reached out to Scott who I had talked to about, you know, some asking to use some of his information for my own book. Um, you know, if he wanted to go with me and look at these artifacts, he said, sure. So that's kind of how we met. That was in July of 2019. So that was really fun. I stayed in the area for a couple of days. He'd showed me some local Templar and Masonic sites, which was neat. Cool. And then we kind of just started sharing information. I'd gone back to Scotland that fall and I had found some really amazing stuff like Gilmerton Cove, which I talk about in the book, Right. which had these tunnels that run all under Scotland. And I, there was an Ave Virgo Maria symbol there, which was really cool. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, we've kind of just been in touch. We've done some research on some different things together over the last two year and a half, two years, I would say now. So that's awesome. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, I'm gonna bug him see if he can come on and talk. I mean, he's he's getting he's getting into some real deep UFO stuff lately. Um, just oh from, yes, with his friend from the Department of Defense. Yeah, yeah, Holden. Yeah, I've I've been asking him some questions. Had, uh, another um, friend of mine is a um, Canadian Freemason and uh, Ryan. And you know, I was he, he was like, oh, I'm gonna interview Scott. I'm like, okay, cool. 
here's a list of questions. <laughs> ask him about this, 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 and this. Yeah, I'm like, here, ask about this. And he's like getting a bu bug, you know, me bugging him the whole time during the chat. But no, it was cool. Um, but yeah, no, I think there's that's a really cool because that connection exists too. So the Department of Defense guys, the Freemasons, guys, the Freemasons, you know, talking to him and, you know, the UFO thing. And it's all tied together. It totally is. So just amazing. Um, I think it's like getting close, but that's just my personal opinion that like something's going to happen. But, you know, historically, yes, and I would, say, I would say that probably over the last two years, they, the government's kind of been drip feeding us things while distracting us with other things such as, you know, a pandemic. Yeah. And not only that, <laughs> but, but, you know, the, going back to even older times, the people it's, this is an interesting point I'd like to make yeah. the native Americans. You yeah. go to, you know, a lot of the Native Americans, like, for example, out in South Dakota that I know, Chief Gold Might Eagle, if you're really interested in learning about the Natives' interactions and relationships with the star people and star ancestors, you should reach out to Chief Gold Might Eagle. His name is, his white man name is Lauren Zephyr. Okay. So he actually does a lot of events usually, and um, yeah, uh, I would say not, not not festivals, but weekends that he, he goes to events and he'll hold ceremonies and he'll talk about these things. And it's really amazing. But the other thing that's interesting is that not only do they have direct contact with extraterrestrials, the star people and the star ancestors, but also Bigfoot and <laughs> UFO activity, like, you know, off neck the charge neck. on, yeah, on the, um, you know, like the, the res reservations out there. And yeah. it's incredible. When I asked him one time, I said, well, why do the Bigfoots and the UFOs and the aliens all appear out here? You know, why do they appear out here so often and in broad daylight, but not to the rest of us? And he said, because these lands are old and they know that they're safe here. Mm, you know, the reservation sense. is safe land that they won't be bugged on. And right. he said that they feel that they can go there and it's a safe place for them versus the rest of America, the rest of the world, perhaps, which was an interesting point. And I think that goes back to, you know, maybe it's a bloodline thing. Maybe there's ancestors that are locations that people knew that they could go or the star people knew that they could go or Bigfoot or whatever, you know, you want to call these things, these supernatural yeah. beings. And same thing with the Templar tradition and the Masonic tradition going back. Obviously, these people in the first century and before that had a way of contacting them and c communicating with them. And there had to be some kind of trust there. So how is that passed down? How do how do they decide who to talk to or who to visit now? Yeah, no, totally. I mean, I think it's definitely one of those things where, you know, you get, you're, you're taking your life in your hands one way or the other, because, you know, we're afraid of everything that we don't understand. I mean, you said that in your book, I think, you know, we're totally afraid yeah. of, you know, of everything we don't understand or, or anyone. And we just, right. you know, we react really badly to new things as humans, you know, it's just like, oh, it's new. <laughs> and I don't know what this is. Kill yeah. it. You know, I mean, it's terrible. Yeah. But, you know, Native Native people uh, have a tighter connection to the earth and, you know, to the spirits, the sky, to everything. Life in general. Yeah, completely. Right. So it's kind of like that. And, and like you said, I, you know, it may be a, 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 um, a bloodline thing as well. Not out of the question. Um, you know, I did, I did a little bit of digging in that after I've done a little research that, you know, Native American people have uh, a blood tie to Scottish people, believe it or not, Scott, Scotch Irish. Um, there's a there's a bloodline connection there, which is like, how does that even happen? When you think about it, you know, there, is it a land bridge? Is it something else? It's like, I, I don't know, but it's a connection, you know? It's not, right. um, it, it's not, um, Russian, <laughs> you know, or whatever. It's, no. No. <laughs> it's not Finnish, you know, it's, it's definitely a weird, um, connection too. And then one of the things that really uh, strikes me as interesting and I, and I want to dig deep into as well is that, you know, when, um, uh, the Templars first came here, you know, um, Scott's done a lot of work on this in the Kensington runestone, uh, type era, you know, way before Columbus, um, that the native people had ceremonies the same as um, the, the Freemasons did. They, they had the same type of, yes. yeah. And if you know about that, please enlighten me. I've done a little bit of research, but I mean, that's amazing that it's like, hey, we're this group of Templars from Scotland and we're here in America. We've never been before. And we met these native people that are doing the same type of ceremonies and believe the same things that we do. How is that possible? You know? Well, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, I know there's many different groups out there, but I am aware of the Daywin, which I know Scott has actually been to a ceremony with them, to a sweat with them. Mm -hmm. And they ha it's their own fraternity, of course, but mm -hmm. I don't know about any other tribes that have their own. I'm sure that they exist, but they're just probably kept very quiet. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the connection between the Templars and the Native people, the Natives, many different tribes, talk about today the Templars and consider them their blood brothers. I'd even asked Chief Gold Mighty Eagle about it, and he had told me, oh, yes, we, we had Templar brothers. And it was just, you know, in the Lakota, in the Lakota way, Lakota right. tradition. And 
I just thought that was incredible. But there's so many similarities. And I kind of want to talk about White Buffalo Calf Woman because oh, I really she, do too. <laughs> yeah. This, this prophecy about her returning is so in sync with the with the time now because we're in the age of Aquarius, the return mm -hmm. of the feminine. And Aquarius is literally the grail bearer, the mm -hmm. cup bearer. Right. You know? And so I thought that was really incredible that there's this going hand in hand with that. On one side of the world, there's a talk about uh, in different traditions that the feminine is going to return or the goddess is going to return. And then here in North America, there's a prophecy about white buffalo calf woman returning. Right. And I will say this, and I know that it might upset some people, but I think in the book, I get into the fact that I really connect white buffalo calf woman with Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different traditions throughout the Native Americans that talk about a white woman in some way, whether it's a white painted woman, white buffalo calf woman, or even down in the Mayans talk about a, a white brother coming to them. In the Cherokee, you have a story, I believe, about a white brother. And I just think that's really interesting. And I think that maybe early on, Jesus and Mary Magdalene came to North America and taught some traditions that they had previously in Europe and in the Middle East. Because one of the things that the Lakota tradition teaches is the seven sacred rites of white buffalo calf women. Right. And right. those, if you really break them down and look at them with an open mind, you can see several connections with the seven sacred sacraments. Totally. Of Jesus. And so White Buffalo Calf Woman was prophesied to return about 2,000 years later, I believe. And here she is. And she's there's been, um, you know, several White Buffalo Calves born out on the res. Right. So they think she's already returned. And that's a way of making her appearance clear. Uh -huh. Because we're in the stage now where a connection to source and, you know, I, I'm trying to get into this. How do I put this? A connection to source and having that relationship with spirit and even with the feminine, with the earth, with the life, with life in general mm -hmm. is a feminine concept. And that's something we need now more than ever. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, it, it, men have screwed it up for far too long. <laughs> you know, I know, one, look where we are now. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I mean, I've said this in a bunch of my talks too. And I mean, but I'm serious. It's like, you know, there, and I say this and I'm being completely honest. I, I think my theory is, is at one point, um, you know, women completely and rightfully so controlled everything, ran everything. It was just the way it was, well, right? Did. Archaeologically, it's, it's clear that that was the case. Yeah. So it's completely. Uh, so at some point there was some group of men that got together and it was like, uh, okay, we're not going to do this anymore. And then right. I'll put it all these control, control structures and, you know, in religion and, and everything else to, to tamper down that to, to, you know, subjugate it and just kind of repress it in a way where it's terrible now, you know, I mean, it, it um, because it's like, well, this is the right way to do it. We can't do anything about it. These women are all powerful. They can do anything they want <laughs> They basically create life, destroy life, whatever. We can't have it. We got, we can't, you know, we're, we're men, we got to stop it, you know, and then, and they, they've suppressed it and it, it's to the detriment of mankind for thousands of years. And that's just my personal belief. You know, I, I really I think that we need that switch. No, and it's not that we need a switch. It's that we need balance. We need the masculine and the feminine. If we're going to have a male leader, we need to have a female leader next to him. You know, a lot of, of even the Native American cultures, even if there was a chief that ruled, mm -hmm. his wife was what he went to and, you know, talked to about things before making decisions. They did not go to war, go to battle without consulting the, the elderly women. And the elderly women were the wise women of the tribe. Right. The grandmothers were weird because they were old and wise and they were very sacred for that reason and that's who made the decisions for the tribe was the women yeah no totally and, and i think i'm hopefully we're getting there i think there's like you know age aquarius i think it's getting back i think there's this is the way this is the rockiness before we get all this stuff that's going on but i really think it's going to happen i hope so, I hope so. Yeah. And there's, there's an interesting theory that that actually is presented in a book called uh when god was a woman mm. and it's a great book it's an older book and i'm probably about halfway through it now but there was a part that talked about, an archaeologist had proposed a theory that the reason why people thought women were sacred going back thousands of years ago was that they didn't understand the relationship between sex and babies. And they didn't understand that when a woman was with a man, that that's what created a child. You know, they, they say that maybe they thought women just magically you know, became with child. Mm. And it's Mind sense, you know, that, that they were able to do that. And that's what was, made them so special. And that when they understood that connection, that's when the split started and they started depressing women because then they thought they held all the power. Ah. I don't know if I quite agree with that. It's, it's interesting, but I'm not sure because I feel like as humans or as a woman, even you have that intuition where you kind of know 
maybe not. I can't say because I didn't live back then, but. I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, just be able to decipher things that are left, like the ruins and the things and the, you know, and, um, the monuments and the uh, temples and things that are erected to the goddesses. I mean, you would think that it was a huge undertaking to do something like that. To, to, yeah. to, you know, gather the materials, to have somebody skilled craftsmen and women, you know, to do that, you know, to do all these things. And, and for what? I mean, it had to have been something of uh, immense value, you know. And, 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 and a lot of people think, in my mind, a lot of these things we look at are temples or just shrines or tombs. They always call them, right? Burial tombs or whatever. But I think these things actually had working um they were they they served a purpose other than just what what we consider a tomb or, or a temple or things like that. I, I really do believe that there are possibly situated on uh, points on the planet, ley lines or things like that. Lines, yeah. yeah, that are definitely connected to other things. Um, and, and held energy or, you know, could trap energy or amplify it or things like that. And for different situations, you know, one of the big things um, that's real near me, I, I live in Ohio as well. I live up in, um, near Toledo, but um, okay. th- down south um, near Cincinnati, uh, um, there's the uh, Serpent Mound, which is the largest. I've spent a lot of time there, yes. Have you? Okay. I'm, I still, I mean, you know, for me, I, duh, I've driven by it, you know, haven't stopped because, you know, that, but, um, you know, it's the large, it's the, is it the largest um, land built um, mound in the world, right? I think that's what it is. Actually, I believe it's the largest effigy mound, yes. Effigy and, mound. Um, at least, at least North America. I'm not sure about the rest of the world for sure, but I know North America it is one of the largest effigy mounds. And it's really incredible because there's also so many features to that. And obviously it's a serpent, but there's a theory that it represents the constellation Draco. Ah. And you know, as above, so below, they were they believe that this place was the center of the universe or that the constellation held a star that was the center of the universe. And there was a star in that constellation that was the pole star before mm-hmm. thousands of years ago. And so the center of Serpent Mound is actually perfectly aligned on a certain day with that star or was at some point. And when the pole stars changed, they actually erased one coil of the serpent and moved it. Wow. To change. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's fix this. <laughs> they went out there and did started digging it. You know, when you think about that, how many thousands of years ago, I mean, it's not like they got backhoes and caterpillars or even shovels for God's sakes. I don't even think they had like, yeah. you know, there's not a forged steel shovel. There's just people pushing dirt up <laughs> onto piles. Right you know, right. completely aligned to star formations, you know. And, and speaking of Serpent Mound, there is an interesting story. I don't know if I wrote about this, but I have to say it because it's super cool. And it's something that you, I've only heard by somebody local. Mm-hmm. I think I heard this from the um, older Indian women that was there. And they were talking about how in the middle of the serpent's eye or head or whatever it is, there was a stone altar that was laid there. It is and, in your uh, book. I read that in your book. It's amazing. Okay. Yeah. And so the the guy that was, you know, taking care of the lands got tired of mowing around it. So he like threw it over the cliffside and just let it fall down there. So now it's still down there and you can go visit it. And the interesting thing is that it's kind of, it has these interesting tunes. Like it's definitely tuned. Different parts of it make different sounds and it wow. just vibrates. It's really cool. But the important part of the story was that they say that a long time ago, this altar was there for a reason, and a lot of native tribes, different tribes from all over, had brought these egg-shaped stones, and they would sh- set these egg-shaped stones on the altar, and they would contain a spirit of somebody that had passed away, and they would set these stones on the altar, and then just about probably, I would say about 15 feet away, I believe, there was a st- there's a post hole there now in the concrete, like it's sinking in there. Mm-hmm. And Jeffrey Wilson's also another, if you want to talk about Serpent Mound and all that kind of stuff, Jeffrey Wilson's the person to, you know, have on about that. But he, he was telling me, he showed me where the post hole was and in the concrete, it's caving in there. So originally they had a wooden pole there and on summer solstice in the evening at sunset, there would be a shadow cast from the pole that touched the altar. And when it would touch the altar, they would say that the spirits were released to the heavens. Wow. That's so awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So some of those egg shaped stones you can be, you can find near that toppled over altar stone <laughs> on the side of the cliff. Has everybody say, said, Hey, maybe we should go pick that up. Uh, you know, like that, that's, I don't know. Maybe that should be my, my summer project. Get a bunch of dudes yeah. down there to raise it back up, you know, yeah. so we can get about 15 guys and some ropes to make it happen. For sure. That would be awesome. I mean, it's just laying there on the side of the cliff. It's it's crazy to me that people can just leave that. And there is also a story. Another thing that's really interesting was uh, on the backside of Serpent Mound, kind of where the bathrooms are, there was 
three holes, three parts of Earth that caved into underground caves. Really? And there had been some that talked about being a child and remembering playing in those caves at some point. But I can't. I think that person died. Or nobody's been able to get in touch with whoever that was. Or I don't know. There was some fluke there. But it was an interesting story. And these holes had opened up again, I think, several years ago, maybe more recently. I'm not sure. Can't remember exactly when it was. But they had backfilled it with, you know, gravel and dirt. And I'm like, no, what if there's what if there's stuff down there? If these were really caves beforehand, you right. know, maybe there's some kind of burial or there are some sites underground. I mean, caves were so sacred to the people too. Mm -hmm. Totally. And, and then and when all, you get down the farther south in Ohio, I mean, it's just full of caves down there when you hit it that yeah. whole that whole side and it goes all the way down. Absolutely. I mean massive caves. I mean some giant caves down there. So yeah, mm -hmm. I mean completely. And also, I mean, I don't know if this is completely known or not, but I think Scott Walter and I were talking about it. Um, on Twitter, believe it or not, we we're going back and forth because yeah, he had gone this summer, I think, and took a picture or, or somewhere this fall or something. And I was like, oh, hey, that's my backyard, you know? And I'm like, I heard there's a lot of magnetic anomalies there as well. Like if you take yes. a compass, it just it does a bunch of crazy things. And, I, and also, I think Scott may have said this, that they think that it may be even built on a site of a, a previous meteor impact. Oh, but no, it is. It definitely is 100% uh, in an impact crater. So that's why there's so many magnetic anomalies um, but I believe it's right on the outside, maybe kind of towards the, the outer part of the impact crater. But yeah, that's definitely a big part of the site. And maybe that's part of the reason why it was so sacred because of these magnetic anomalies due to that impact crater. Right, right. You know, it's, we all have, you know, magnetic receptors. I think that's been proven now that, you know, humans as well. I mean, we always knew that birds, you know, homing pigeons, sharks, things like that had, you know, different types of magnetic receptors in their brains be able to tail north and south and hum I, I want to believe that humans did as well and and previously especially native people could you know connected more to the earth maybe you could feel that a lot more than you could feel now you know we always get like the hair standing up on your arms and things when things yeah. aren't right but i mean if it's back in that time i mean imagine that compared to everything else it'd be like a oh maybe that's how these ley lines did exist you walked into it and you're like okay this is weird all right all right cool we're gonna do something here because of the energy and, and the things that are going on but I don't know. Just theorizing. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's very possible. And I think that that's the, that's, that's the reason why a lot of places are deemed sacred. I mean, especially when you go over to Europe, those ley lines exist for a reason because those were energetical points on the earth that in some way were sacred and people felt that different vibration or different frequency or whatever it might've been that was sacred to them. And I think it's interesting now because we are so, uh, you know, this is something that I actually, Actually, even one of my astronomy classes made this point and we were talking about moon cycles and yeah. so obviously they're sacred for a lot of reasons but there's 13 you know lunar cycles in a year women have 13 menstrual cycles in a year right. and in the native traditions they call that moon time so women have moon time aligned with the moon which i think is really interesting mm -hmm. and not only that but in today's society there is such a disconnect from that and i think it's for many reasons for one our sleep schedules are so different two we're exposed to different things we're, we're, we're eating food that is you know genetically modified we're drinking water that probably isn't the most pure water and we're you know watching tv we're using electricity we're around all these different all this different kind of technology and all of that does have an effect on our bodies oh, and i think that's why you know women aren't as synced up with the moon cycles as they used to be in the old times and um you know there was an experiment done where a woman or multiple women had slept with a light on in their room for certain days like during the full moon and it helped regulate them, which was kind of an interesting experiment. Huh. It was proven that there's a connection there between the moon and the moon cycle, the, the, between the moon, moon cycles, and women's cycles, obviously. But yeah. uh, I just found that really fascinating because our bodies are totally aligned with nature in every way. But it's just the, the technology and I think the frequencies from technology and all of that that totally disrupt our natural cycles. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, I joke with my wife and I'm like, yeah, it's the full moon, right? <laughs> it's coming up. <laughs> it's, yeah. you know, but, but reading in your book, you know, it was amazing too. When you talk about the moon cycles, it was a, a sacred ceremony for the native people where the, the women would be coming oh, of age and they would have a, um, their own ceremonies and, you know, basically bleed onto the earth. And, you mm -hmm. know, um, uh, you know, I learned all this from your book. Thank you very much. But yeah, it was, a, it's a definitely, um, uh, a ceremony, I think, right? In a way, I mean, you probably phrase it better than me from what my understanding from just reading your book, but basically it's like, it was a very sacred thing and the women participated together and it was a very big deal when a woman first, you know, got her first period and her first cycle and shared that experience and came into womanhood, you know, and that, 
that, and you know, men didn't share in that obviously. Um, but they had their own ceremonies, I think, right. Was it separate? Were men separated always from that? Obviously they, they weren't involved in that. It was a sacred woman thing. Yes. Yes. So usually I know in the Lakota ways, they would go out of, they would go out of the village and they would stay in their own place. Usually probably, you know, and most tribes did this. Uh, most, most cultures did this. They would have like a hut or um, maybe a teepee or maybe some kind of other lodge built that they would stay in during this time. And they would stay there together mm -hmm. and they would be doing things like, you know, sewing arts and crafts type of things, but they would be together for it because all the women would have the same cycle right. and they would all go for that time be left alone and so some some cultures did have ceremonies for um well most cultures did have ceremonies for women coming of age that were getting their first moon cycle mm -hmm. and i think it's really interesting that they did that because could you imagine today like you know let's say let's say i i get my first moon cycle and the i my mom goes running out to the town and shouts to everybody hey Haley just got our first period everybody let's <laughs> celebrate you know everybody, everybody drops happened. their stuff and let's go do some crafts <laughs> 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 I just can't imagine that today. Back then, that's how it was. And the reason was they weren't afraid of nature. They weren't like today. It's kind of taboo to talk about periods and oh, yeah. sex and all these different things. But back then, that was everyday conversation. <laughs> that was dinner time conversation. You know? so yeah. Back it was a then, big deal. part of life. Yeah. yeah. And, and everybody participated. And everybody made that woman when it was her first moon time. Everybody made that woman feel, you know, like she was sacred that's when she became a goddess essentially she right. had the ability to go to the spirit world and bring back a life you know and that's why it was so sacred that's amazing Haley. i love your book man and you're awesome thank you so much i mean this has been really cool <laughs> seriously i mean i just i'm really excited because i really think that this you know the divine feminine is coming back i really do like i feel it you know and I joke around and I'm like, I always keep, I keep joking around and I'm like, I'm kind of scared. I like, I, I feel like she's like, just right hanging out over here going, Hey John. And I'm like, uh, yeah. and I'm going, it's not, not right. Just not yet. I mean, just for a minute, I know you want to talk, but just, uh, I don't know if I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah. She's coming. <laughs> she's coming. Yeah. I think I just, I just yeah. got to get, I think doing things like this and, and learning more and researching, you know, it'd be prepared for it for sure. Because I mean, there's a lot, I don't know. I mean, obviously I, I dug really deep into Hathor and, um, you know, just from a lot from, you know, I've talked to Ryan Bledsoe a lot, you know, I mean, his dad, I don't know if you're, you're familiar with the Bledsoe story, Chris Bledsoe and all that stuff or no, am I? I'm not, I'm not. Oh, wow. I'll have to give you the, 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 um, condensed version. Uh, so Chris mm -hmm. Bledsoe, um, and I'll send you some links. It'll make it a lot easier, but you know, um, so basically Chris Budzo had his experience as a guy in North Carolina, um, he's fishing with some guys down by the river. He had seen some orbs. Um, basically what this transpired to is that he was missing him and his son were missing, um, in front of a bunch of people for, uh, hours. And they were like, where did you go? They came back. Uh, a craft was there. All these guys got freaked out, jumped in the car. They thought it was the end of the world. Everybody kind of went back to their own thing. Anyways, Chris ends up having this another experience with these beings, white beings. We kind of look at them like grays. Um, uh, and you know, he, he, he has, he had, um, um, uh, a, a, a disease and he was actually ended up curing of it. And I'm trying to remember what it was right now. It was, um, and I can't remember what it is. So forgive me, but it's, um, something with your digestive system, something with your stomach. It was really, really like basically killing him and ended up healing him. Um, it wasn't it, stomach cancer. Was it? No, it wasn't stomach cancer. It was, um, you know, I got on. I feel bad that I remember it's, um, I think it was Crohn's. I'm sorry. It was Crohn's 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 okay. disease. Crohn's disease. Okay. I just couldn't remember the name of it. <laughs> I was thinking crow and I'm like, it's not a disease. It's Crohn's. So he had Crohn's really bad. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it ended up curing him of Crohn's. Um, he had this experience with this, this being, um, very religious, very religious family kept it really quiet for a real long time when he did came out and talk about it. Um, MUFON had, a um, a CAA plant. That was the head of MUFON at the time or came down there and basically whitewashed this whole story. They did a Discovery Channel episode of it. This is 15 years ago now and basically, um, you know, made him look like an idiot. Uh, you know, did a lie detector test, which is completely wrong, like all this stuff to just basically, you know, make a story go, as well, go away. Um, another thing happened where he was outside. This thing came out. It was his orb came down and a bull ran him over. You know, this thing came out and a bull came out and charged him. He fell over to the ground and he got up and there was a white lady there, a woman in white hovering over the ground and she said this is yours to bear you have to give this message you, you know this is this is what's happening and then started giving prophecies and all these things that were going on wow yeah so this was you know been the past 15 years or so um it, it gets it gets a little bit deeper but basically it just comes back all the time these orbs come back all the time his video and evidence and stuff like that um 
He's in contact with the CIA. Like every every ag- agency you can possibly imagine is there uh, all the time. They know that the white they know the lady's real, and they don't. They the lady's not talking to them, so they want Chris to tell them what the lady what's what she wants, what's going on. Um, these are government ag- agencies that are wanting to know these things that are yeah monitoring him. Yes. Wow. Yep. Yep, they're friends. They, there's pictures of them hanging out. Um, you know, Ryan um, was Ryan. This is the the, the other son. Um, and he, I, I want to say, he was like 14, 13, 14 when it started happening. You know, he's in his twenties now. Wow. Yeah, so he's been like, there's been government agents. I mean, they've all done the crazy things to threaten him, his family, and tell him they were going to kill him, things like that. Up to just you know uh, the, uh, the gamut of the whole thing, just being friends with them to like, hey, we're going to kill you. Like all kinds of different things, you know, NASA's, I mean, they've taken Chris through NASA to places where the president even goes and there's photos of all this stuff. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, they had a deal. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, it's been really hard for him and, you know, pretty cool for him at the same time, but the lady keeps yeah. coming back and that's this thing. It's just, it's the it kills of their mother, the divine feminine, the lady, she keeps coming back and uh, it's Hathor, I guess is kind of the thing, the bull uh, Hathor, all this stuff. And she's like, basically you know, we have a choice. We have to, you know, love or fear and love is the only way it's going to happen. We, you know, we have to raise our vibration up. We have to love. It's the only way we're going to save the world. You know, there's a bunch of people that want the end of the world. They're, you know, dark forces. They're, that they're using the book of revelations. They're using it as a playbook to bring about the end times. And there's another group of people that are just want, you know, peace and love and, and happiness and, you know, the age of Aquarius and all that stuff. And, you know, the messages she's given him are just amazing. Like, you know, and you think of, you hear all this stuff and you're like, wow. All right. But you know, he was talking about, his, he went to one of these conferences and he was talking about his UFO experience. Well, it was, he was, he was scheduled to talk about his UFO experience. And this, the lady had just came to him a couple of weeks before him. And he just started talking about the lady and these people started heckling him. They're like, we don't want to hear about that. We want to hear about the UFO thing. And it was just got so upset that he said, Hey, on this date at this time, there's going to be this magnitude earthquake. And he's like, I didn't even say it. It just came out of me. And literally like that played out, like whenever that was, like whenever that date and time. Wow. <laughs> and so that's when the guy, like after then it was like, okay, a lot of attention, boom, right away. You know, there's still a huge military, a military, yeah, um, government interest. And he's yeah. where? He's in is South in Carolina, North, you said? Uh, North Carolina, North Carolina. North Carolina. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, that's, but I mean, that's incredible. I was not aware of the story at all. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, I'll hook you up um, with some links and stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's just an amazing mix. And he's the most awesome human on the planet. Chris, is, I mean, just the most guy. He does does great interviews. Um, thing was is that he um, at some point he signed a, a deal for um to do a book um a uh, movie about his experiences. So he had like it was so, so many years he couldn't talk about it or whatever. Um, but the oh, lady, that's not right. It should never be for years. So she, that, that's far too long to not be able to talk about something like that. Cause he's going to be missing out on a lot of other opportunities too. Well, so that's this, disappointing. yeah, well, the lady came back to him and said, you know what? Time to talk now. Like last year, last, mm-hmm. not this Easter, but last Easter, she's always comes on Easter for sure. Came on Easter and was like, now's your time to talk. We're going to help you with more evidence. We're going to help you with you know, to get the message out. So, I mean, Chris has got a Facebook page. Um, he doesn't have Twitter, but Ryan, his son, Dwight has a Twitter, but you know, Chris is I film it all the time. Orbs yeah, all the time, just coming down, you know, they respond to him, they come to him. It's just, it's just the most amazing thing. They, I mean, there was a tree in his backyard. He was trying to, it was, he, he didn't know if he wanted to meet with these people from Hollywood before he signed this deal. And he asked for a sign and this tree had been raining for three days in his backyard and this tree caught on fire. And they went out and they put it out on fire, just at the middle of the tree, inside the tree and out just the, the tree catches on fire. Wow. So he's like, okay, that's the sign. So they put it out three times that night and it's, it just kept coming back on fire. And now it's like, it just, it's going back. It's the most amazing tree. But from what I heard that people would, people would send clothes and stuff to animals and things like that. And people would put things in this tree and they would, when you would get them back, you would be healed of whatever sickness or whatever you, you have like, yeah can't stage four cancer stuff like that yeah i actually there's a site that i visited in france and I, i'm trying to think i i believe that the locals call it the yoni caves not sure if i took a photo of this or not Did okay. i talk about this in the book? uh i don't think so i don't think I, 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 probably, I need to go back and add that in there but if i haven't but yoni caves were beautiful and it, this was in the south of france somewhere and i need to look and see exactly where it was but it was right beneath the templar stronghold right beneath uh, a, a commandery actually and the, so the templar commandery was up in the town and this cave had a tunnel system that likely probably ran to the commandery but right. anyway this, this cave basically was you know these two egg-shaped 
you know, carved out aspects of the cave and the cave arches over. And then in the middle, there is running water that comes and creates an X oh. over the rock. And the rock there is red because of the minerals. There's, there's really high concentrations of different minerals there. And it looks like, you know, ovaries. When you step back and you look, it looks ah. like ovaries. And so when you'd be walking into the cave, you'd be walking into the womb of the, earth, ah. of the goddess, right? So this water there, people have been saying for probably thousands of years that it was sacred and had healing properties. And I was standing out there with a woman named Annie, I believe, and she was fantastic, Annie Williams. And we're out there and she's telling me about the different experiences she's had there and about kind of the history of the area. And this man comes up, he's driving by and he stops his car and he rolled his, rolls down the window and he starts passionately going on speaking French. And I speak very little French. So I'm, I'm hearing some words here like <laughs> feeling, you know, sickness, my sin. He's pointing to his stomach and he's all worked up about this, throwing his hands up. And Annie speaks a little bit more than me. And she turns and she says, he said he moved here so many years ago because he was very sick and people told him to come here and drink the water every day. And he had a stomach problem of some sort. And so he came and drank the water every day. And after three months, he was healed. Wow. And so he was going on and on saying, drink the water, drink the water. <laughs> so I had I had to get some water and take take some home with me, which was, you know, cool. But yeah. th that's one of the sites in the world that, you know, is a healing site and that uh, the water in, in different places, even at Serpent Mound, there's a spring nearby that they say the water is healing there. Wow. And it's actually like kind of right off the high, off the road and it's right in front of someone's house, but you can just walk up there and fill up your water bottles with, you know, the water there, which is kind of neat. And they're cool about it. It's, it was, yeah, it's Ohio. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was like, okay, cool. That's yeah. rad. Yeah. I definitely yeah. need to go down there. I think there's a, a huge, there's something definitely going on there. Ohio is just littered with things. If you, if you look at okay. all the yeah. mounds, uh, just amazing, yes. you know? Yes. I don't know what was going on here <laughs> back then. Well, there used, to be, there used to be sites like this all over North America. But the sad thing is, for example, Texas. Mm. Texas lacked a lot of archaeological context because, you know, it wasn't part of the Union for a very long time. Right, right. And during that time period, Texas never had any real archaeology done. Like you had people in the 1800s in Ohio documenting mounds and doing excavations and that kind of thing. But in right. Texas, that never existed. We never had that. It was the frontier. It was the Wild West. We just had people coming out here. And if there were mounds, they were digging them up or knocking <laughs> them over, building on top of them, building into them, whatever. You know, well, they we found some dinosaur them. bones. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, and people were afraid. Frankly, they were afraid of the Indians here. They didn't okay. want to interact with their burial mounds they probably didn't want to touch them yeah. you know because i thought they were cursed or whatever but yeah it's interesting because texas never had any real archaeology done until like pretty recently in the grand scheme of, of you know this country and the other states had archaeology starting pretty early like late 1700s early 1800s people were really getting interested in these sites and some of them were preserved and others weren't there is a site probably about an hour from here called Caddo mounds and it's one of the few preserved sites in texas and there, the, it was the Caddo Indians that built them. Mm. And then there's some mounds also about 45 minutes from me that are on private property, but they're not open to the public and they won't disclose the location because people have gone and tried to, you know, grave rob, mm. unfortunately, Loot, dig up yeah. the mounds. But there's a lot more history, I think, here that's been hidden or forgotten or lost just because there wasn't proper archaeology done and poor documentation done of these sites. And a lot of them also, for example, Cahokia, well, Serpent Mound, before they had this the actual Serpent Mound, they had an observatory out where the parking lot is that was, a, you know, uh, not a Stonehenge, but a Woodhenge. And that's where they calculated the astronomical alignments. Because if you go to the Serpent, the alignments aren't totally spot on. Yeah. And it's because they were done a little ways back in the parking lot. And same thing at Cahokia in Saint, near St. Louis, Missouri. And um, they, they had a Woodhenge there as well to calculate the astronomical alignments. And so I believe that part of the problem is a lot of this, this lower path of, you know, North America was usually people using wood because that's what was so abundant. Right. Yeah. And wood structures aren't going to be preserved like they would, like stone would be, you know. Totally. Yeah. I mean, there's... Example is America's Stonehenge in New Hampshire. And, you know, Dennis Stone, the owner, and I co-research and share things like that. And, you know, his side is really amazing for several reasons. But up there, there's so many stones. Why would they need to use wood to build things yeah. when they have access to so many stones? Whereas down here, there's not the geology doesn't lend itself to that. It's going to be trees and wood people are using to build things. Yeah, totally. No, yeah. It makes, I mean, I live in the biggest oak forest in the world, pretty much. <laughs> That's like, yeah. why not? Yeah. You know, just stick it in the ground. It'll be there forever, you know at least a couple mm -hmm. hundred years you know i always thought it was hilarious or in, in you know school read about um 
how American oak was prized for ships in, in you know, the 16, 1700s because cannonballs would literally bounce off of it. Like the British yeah. ships would hit like American ships with the oak and it would be like, and it wasn't even steel. It was just that hard American oak, you know, so yeah. kind of interesting, but no, it's, it it's, is. it's awesome. It's, I'm so happy that you're so excited and passionate about history and archaeology. I think it's awesome. I think that there needs to be a billion more of you. And, and, uh, there's, and, there's not enough people. There's not enough people in my generation that are interested. And it's really sad because, you know, for that reason, most of my friends are two, three times my age because I, <laughs> I you know, and it's sad because I wish that more young people would get into it. But I think that there has been in the recent years, there's been a growth in interest in history and archaeology and younger generations, which I think is fantastic because, you know, we need more archaeologists, more geologists, more um, you know, just people, historians, I mean, people that are willing to put in the work and work in this area and help uncover so much that's been lost. I mean, it's like the ocean. We, there's so much more that we don't know about the ocean, you know, that, than we do know. And same thing with history. I mean, it's right. like we're constantly uncovering a, a different chapter every day that we're working on it. And it's just incredible to me. They're still finding new things in Egypt and in Europe and it's everywhere. Am, it's amazing. And, and the suppression of it, I mean, I hate to say this, put on the conspiratorial hat, but I mean, oh, we've yeah. seen it no, for no, the... Yeah, huge. Absolutely. I mean, it's a huge um, tampering down of like n when you find something that goes against the known record, they just throw it out. In a lot of cases, yeah. it's just like, oh yeah, that's that's not that can't be real at all. That doesn't fit into our mold. We're gonna throw it away. Yes, and it's the out of place artifacts that really seem to upset people and get them real excited about things, and not always in a good way. And that's like that's what's happened with the Kensington Runestone. I mean, yeah. that's what's happened with, you know, for example, America's Stonehenge has faced a lot of backlash too. And some people sit here and try to say, oh no, this can't, this can't be true, or this can't be real, or this was a hoax, this blah, 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 blah. But for example, um, one of the stone serpents, I think at America's Stonehenge just got back a date and it was, it was a bioluminescence dating, I think, or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. I forget, it was OSL, it was OSL. And the, the date under the stone serpent, you know, for the stone serpent wall, or the wall, I can't remember, I think it was part of the stone serpent, was like the 14th century. Wow. And so that proves that it was definitely, you know, pre-Columbian, it was in the 1300s. And so that was interesting. And that's, that's one, hard, you know, that's some hard data people cannot argue with. The data is the data. And a lot of times that's the issue is these archaeologists want to take the data and argue with it, but the science doesn't lie. People do. You know? <laughs> yeah. And it's so hard though, because I mean, then it gets, you know, it's only printed and people only know about it. If you're passionate about it and you care about it and you things like, you know, things like that. But I mean, somebody's going to print a textbook and somebody in high school or is going to read this book and say, Hey, this is how it is. And if you don't, if you don't care enough about it or are passionate enough about it, you're just going to believe whatever you're taught and, and not, you it's know, it's just like religion. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly it's like not a religion. It's a science. <laughs> Same thing with archaeology. It's become too political, like religion. You know, it's it's sad because we, I mean, you can't be political when it comes to science. You can't, it, it, there's just too much that there has to be hard science for and, you know, hard data for to really argue it and make it political. Well, for example, like Scott did all the work on the runestone and people yeah. still sit here and try to argue it. I mean, there are some things like that you know, the people just insist that it's fake and not really have a good reason to argue it. They just insist that it is, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. So for example, the root leachings, I, I think it was on the, on the runestone go back to 30 years, 15 or 30 years before Olaf Omen, they were that old, 15 mm -hmm. or 30 years old, I don't remember which number when Olaf Omen had pulled up the stone. So if they were that old, he obviously did not, you know, carve the runestone. He had just immigrated to America, you know, had been there for a while. So it was at least the, the runes had to be at least 15 to 30 years old. But, you know, it, and it was obviously based on the context of the artifact and what it said and, it's, you know, its content. It definitely had to have been an authentic Templar artifact from the 1300s. So yeah. there's just no doubt about it in my mind. And there's some things that you just people... It's frustrating for me, too, because I get that a lot, being interested in this kind of history, mm -hmm. especially when I talk about the Templars and mysticism and the Grail. And, you know, everybody wants to argue with me about about all of it and about the bloodline, especially. So and people say there's no evidence, but there really is quite a bit of evidence when you really look for it. Yeah, definitely. I think the bloodline has a huge play in all of that, too. Um, you know, it's always been my personal belief, and I've only done, a, you know, a minuscule amount of research on it. But, um, you know, Reese's negative bloodline to me stands out as a huge question mark in the whole grand scheme of yeah. human evolution. You know, I'm, you know, be negative and um, you know, it's amazing because my wife, it's, it's really weird. My wife's be negative. 
um, you know, it's kind of weird. My, my, both my parents, you know, the whole side of that family, yeah. you know, it's just like my daughter, you know, everybody, it's just like, wow, that's kind of weird. You know, do you find these people? Do you interact with people? You know, um, you know, do you, is there something going on that you can, you know, connect with people that are, you know, of the same negative blood? Type? I don't know. It's, it's always one of the things. So, you know, it kind of weirds people out, but I was like, Hey, what's your blood type? You know, like, most people don't know, which is amazing to me. People don't know. Do you yeah, know? I- so, yeah, I, I need to find out because it might, yeah, I, I do need to find out what it is. Yeah, no, I mean, what? I, I don't know how I, I can't remember. I, I found out when I think when I donated blood, when I went to like Red class when I was like in high school or whatever, and it was that became a thing. It was also a thing when my wife became pregnant because if you are disparate blood types, you know, the woman has to get a shot because basically if she was positive and I was negative, her, her, her body would reject the fetus. Right. So, so she had to get, you have to have some type of shot that basically, you know, keeps the baby from being aborted. And so, but we were both being negative and it's like, oh, cool. You know, I mean, that's a thing, you know, for the, how many thousands of years that happened where you, you just couldn't have made it with somebody that was the opposite blood type. And you think back and it's like, and it's only like, what is it? Like 5% of the population or something is a negative blood type. It's like, how's that even possible? If we all evolved for monkeys yeah. and a rhesus monkey, then how, there's no negative <laughs> there's zero negative blood type monkeys <laughs> or orangutans any type of primates so like, where does yeah. that come from well and i was just ta- having this conversation with a friend yesterday about what makes us attracted to other human beings and part of me wonders if it's not you know obviously genetics there is a show on netflix and this concept of it was really interesting the show itself wasn't that great but it was mm-hmm. called the one mm-hmm. and basically it was about this dna company that was able to take your dna and match you with the one person in the world that you're guaranteed to fall in love with. <laughs> and I thought, well, that would give dating sites a run for their money. That's an interesting <laughs> concept. Because that would mean that it is genetic somehow, the way that we are attracted to people and that kind of thing. So I do wonder if not only that plays a part into it, but also um, I was discussing uh, ancestral interaction. You oh. know, I've noticed in a lot of times throughout different times in my own genealogy that the same families are coming together and marrying. And it's really weird. Like, you know, obviously it, it depends on the location, but even like relocating to the States and in different areas, there's so many of the same families that kind of end up together again. And it's just strange to me. I, I, I just, it's so interesting how human connection works. I think there is a lot, you know, there's obviously a lot of our brain that we don't understand right? and we don't know what it does, but I think there's just, there's just so many mysteries out there about DNA and what, what it can do and what it can tell us. Yeah. I mean, it's a really good point uh, to talk about in your book too. You're talking about um, uh, mitochondrial DNA. It's passed from the mother and, right. only, the mo- and only the mother, right? So, yes. you know, and and that, it, that leads me to the topic of parthenogenesis, which is one of my favorite things to talk about because let's talk uh, about it. Would, <laughs> yeah, It could potentially mean that women did not need men at some point in time. Uh, parthenogenesis has been observed on a small scale in different species, but never obviously in, you know, humans or not that we like documented us, though. Right. I mean, it could have happened. You, you, right? How could you document that? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. So I think it's, it's possible that at some point in evolution, maybe it were, it was females, you know, it's interesting because in the Bible, they talk about Adam and Eve and the first humans, but what if the first human was actually female and she didn't need, she was parthenogenetic. So she did not absolutely need a male companion. She was able to procreate on her own. But the right. question would be, what would have happened that would have made it necessary to have also a man at some point for her to be able to reproduce. I mean, unless there was some, I, I can't, I can't imagine what an issue would be that would cause that to happen or what would happen in genetic modification over time evolution that would, would cause that. But parthenogenesis is the ability to, as a female, not being asexual, but the ability of a female to actually conceive of your own will mm-hmm. and not need, you know, a man to do it, which I think is a really interesting concept because now, I mean, obviously I'm not going to get pregnant just because I really want to, or I think about it a lot. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, back then, if women could do that, that that's really amazing. I mean, I could understand why people revere her as a goddess. Well, so mitochondrial it, DNA. I'm sorry, did right, but wasn't but, um, but didn't wasn't Hathor or um, a Ra or or um, one of the earlier goddesses? It wasn't or wasn't that their um, one of their abilities to to procreate um, from their own body? I think. And I'm, I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying to maybe, remember. I mean, I'm, I don't recall that, but I do know. Isis, for example, she was, uh, she'd conceived and had a quote unquote virgin birth, which was not really a virgin birth because mm-hmm. the story was that she, uh, her husband had been killed by his brother and she goes and picks up all the different pieces of his body. And when she puts them back together, she 
conceives, but of his dead body, you know? Yeah. So obviously there's supposed to be a sexual relationship there, but at the same time, like a lot of the traditions say that she stood over his body and magically conceived, mm. you know? So I don't know how that all happened. But, <laughs> I don't know, yeah, but I think it's interesting. I think that's the only thing I'm aware of as far as conceiving by your own free will. And like oh. I said, that the theory of the archaeologist proposed in that book about, you know, people revering women because they thought that she could conceive without sex was yeah. kind of interesting. And maybe, maybe that was, a, a, you know, something at some point in time. But I just think that our instincts as humans are too strong for that to really be the case, to not understand the relationship between, you know, a man and a woman, well, unless, unless like your point is correct that at some point it was, at some point that was the, yeah. that you didn't need man, you know, a woman didn't need a right. man to, to, to create life, right? At that point, then. Well, and that would, that would make sense with mitochondrial DNA and that enigma because mitochondrial DNA is only passed from mother to child. The man's DNA is completely disregarded. It's like, nope, don't need you, I, you know, so that's. <laughs> Just the feminine. And I think that's just a really interesting point. And there's, there's got to be some hang up there or some reason why. I mean, nature has, a, there's a reason for everything in nature. N nature just doesn't decide it's going to do something for the, for the sake of it. But yeah, just toss so that out. There, yeah. Yeah. At some point in time that they decided that for whatever reason, it wasn't necessary. So my, my idea on that was that it was at some point that women were parthenogenetic, maybe men existed, maybe there was a, sh or maybe this was an evolutionary trait. Like maybe women needed men to conceive. And then at some point, some catastrophe happened. There weren't enough men on, on, the, on the earth. Right. And it was a, you know, evolutionary change because they needed to repopulate the earth. And so now this is kind of an interesting time because more women are choosing to not have children. Right. these days so if enough women choose to not have children for a long period of time are we going to start being able to conceive on our own probably i mean i, I guess i hope not <laughs> but I mean, that's an interesting point because you don't ever see that and before something had to have happened to, to cause our bodies to do that to only pass mitochondrial dna down to from the mother yeah, I mean, it's just amazing to me. I mean, and this is just my own personal experience. And, you know, hopefully my dad doesn't hate me for this one. But, you know, when you're a kid and you're, and you're, a, and you're a man, you know, you're like, I was really interested in my father's genealogy, you know, I was, and, you know, he, he, you know, okay, so my dad's dad and what did his do? And what did his dad? And then what was, you know, what was my grandpa? You know, and like, what did, you know, what were these guys? Were they like knights of, you know, were they men of renown and all this stuff? And it's like, when, yeah. when as, as I got older and learned about mitochondrial DNA, that's why I focused way more. And as of even recently on my mother's side, I'm like, that doesn't even matter at all. <laughs> none, yeah. none of that shit doesn't yeah, matter sorry, at all. Sorry, dad. Yeah. Sorry. Uh -huh. none, none of those guys, that could have been the coolest guys, the strong, it could have been Hercules for all I care. None of that DNA is going to be done. Sorry. You know, I mean, <laughs> just not happening you know i mean but why i mean i really would like to understand why from a scientific standpoint i mean even if from a spirituality standpoint and, and that's my belief i mean if you, if you think about it that way then something with the spirit probably transcends via the woman and it's more connected to the 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 source the mother goddess you know um right and more than the man's you know the man are, the men are more like the warrior hunter gatherer uh, i'm gonna beat this rock kind of thing you know um i think we, yeah, the women are yeah. way more connected to the earth and the spirituality you know not to say that all men i'm just saying but i think you know in general you know, speaking as a man well, probably, I, probably guys are gonna be pissed off at me for saying that too but sorry it's how it is sorry dude <laughs> sorry guys but is that that's an interesting point, though, because so many different tribes, so many different cultures still pass on, you know, their lineage is passed on through the, the female mm -hmm. line and through the mother's line. And in some tribes, it would be that when you got married, you went and you lived in the mother's mother of your bride's house, you know, yeah. and because it was the mother that was the head of the household. And that's who you married. And so essentially, I mean, for example, the Mayans, the Mayans were another tribe that, that, that did this, mm -hmm. that everything was matrilineal. And some women were warriors, you know, they were some of the most renowned warriors in, in the tribe. And I, down there, it, there's a lot of that going on. You see a lot of that kind of reverence to the, the feminine and to the, the bloodline going down through the females. There's, there's stuff everywhere all over the world that have those same traditions of it. But it's just interesting to me. And one of the points that was made, I think in the same book I was talking about earlier, was that they were able to know exactly who the mother was when the baby was, you know, popping out of them versus, you know, knowing who the father was because back then there wasn't, you know, maybe you weren't just having one husband or, you know, so there's, there's a possibility you might not know who the child is. So obviously the lineage wouldn't be kept by the, by the father, but you know who the mother is. Right. You know, you, know you, you got that down child. for sure. Right. Yeah. There's yeah. no mistake in that. <laughs> happening, right? Uh-huh. 
Yeah. So that's another, that's a simple point, you know, that it, it would be tracked through the mother because it's obvious who the mother is, but not who the father is. That much can be proven or said for sure. And so it's that weird. Would make sense. It totally makes sense. It's weird that at some point that thing switched because when you look at it the other yeah. way, even just with the Royals, I mean, you know, um, England or, um, you know, the whole, that whole continent, I'm trying to, sorry, I'm going to think, I think of the, uh, <laughs> my brain started to slow down in too many cycles here, but you know, if you look at any type of aristocracy in, in Europe, that's where I was going. Europe, I couldn't think of the name here, but it's all through passed through males. It's the first male born. That right, and you know, it wasn't throw. always the, the husband child, and so that throws out some DNA. For example, I'm part of Clan Ramsey. Clan Ramsey does, as well as many of the different clans, they do their own genealogical project. Oh, but the genealogy. The, the DNA is so different from so many different Ramses. And the reason being because, you know, you might be married, but it's it's tracked through the father, right? right. But the mother you know, might have been seeing the next door neighbor and <laughs> the baby might not be her husband. So instead of being a Ramsey, it might be a, you know, St. Clair or uh, whatever. But it's it's just weird to me that we don't still do that because it makes more sense. It's It just makes sense. When you know who the father is, that's great, but they didn't always know back in the day. Right, right, So that's right. why there's so many genealogical projects that aren't really adding up, like in Clan Ramsey. And adoption, too. A lot of times oh, right. people back then that couldn't, that couldn't conceive would, would take in you know, other children. Mm -hmm. Then it, they'd take the name and you pass that down, but they carry different DNA. Right. At some point, that's got to get sorted out. I mean, DNA is so cheap now and so test and, and so diverse and, and the way that you can sample it. I mean, at some point, you're going to have to go, you, you know, all those all those stars are going to have to align at some point. Yeah, but you might go back being so far as, let's say, I go back so far as being a Ramsey, but then based on my DNA, maybe at some point, one of my great, 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 great grandmothers, you know, who was married to a Ramsey actually had an affair with a McLeod or somebody else. And then I'm actually more, you know, McLeod, <laughs> more McLeod than, than Ramsey. So yeah. it, it's just interesting because you, you don't know exactly who your ancestors are for sure. You can look at the chart and say that looks nice and that's all good. <laughs> but um, yeah, you don't really know for sure, which is kind of, kind of disappointing because I really take pride in knowing who my ancestors were and what they did. Yeah. Yeah. So well, one, one way you could probably do it is that whole negative blood type. Right. Right, I mean, that makes sense. because uh, while it is possible for um, a negative and a positive couple to conceive a child, it's, mm -hmm. it's especially before they figured it out, it was very rare. The, like the mother would reject the baby if it was not the same blood type. So throughout history, I mean, think about, I mean, I don't know what the percentage chances are to survive, but I mean, it wasn't very big. Right. So you would have that preserved. So I would, I would just, I would just imagine that, um, you know, that, that would be a lot easier to trace because of, you know, okay, you got these one or two that are mixed. Okay, fine. But I mean, if you know that you're a negative, you're never like, you know, my wife and I are, are both the same blood type and her daughter is the same blood type. Okay, cool. So if she meets some random guy someday, who's the same blood type as her, you know I mean? Like how far can you ex expound upon that forever? You know, yeah. it's really weird. And the thing that bothers me a little bit, I guess it's just, it is what it is, but especially in the coronavirus stuff, you know, I was looking up any type of data on negative blood type and the coronavirus. I was like, there's got to be some data, you know, because some of the some of the data started coming out that said that people with a uh, blood type were more susceptible to coronavirus, you know, than O oh, and things like that. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I'm like, I wonder about negative blood type. No data because it's such a small. It's like five percent of the population. They're like, eh, well, whatever. It's just it's like, how are you just throwing that out? How could it be like? Could it be like nobody with negative blood type can is uh, susceptible to it, or is it everybody with negative blood type is susceptible? Like, why are you missing that whole data set? But it's out. Yeah. It, so you're saying that they you don't get the virus if you have a negative blood type or no i was I, there's no data to, to support that either way oh. gotcha yeah you know it's strange because for me i was exposed to the virus one of my really close friends she was this was last may and i had gone and spent the weekend with her you know we were we're very close to each other we're putting on makeup on each other all up in each other's faces sharing wine glasses eating the same food and yeah uh, we went out to dinner, had a nice weekend and in the same bed, of course. And that while I was visiting and then the day I left, she started getting sick. And the day after that, she tested positive for the, for the virus mm. and she had gotten a boyfriend at the time, you know, who had also just, brand, just had just been tested positive, but I quarantined for a week and then I took a test a week later and I didn't get it. And we were sharing, sipping out of the same wine glasses, sleeping in the same bed in the same apartment all weekend. Wow. So why would I not? Why wouldn't I have gotten it? I got a suspicion you're probably a negative blood type. You don't know it. It's possible. <laughs> <laughs> Just a shitty theory I have. 
Yeah, it's, it's very possible because I really don't know at this point. I don't know. It's just amazing, you know. I, I don't know. It's. I think it's all tied to you. So let me ask you about the book. I love the book. Mm-hmm. When can people buy it? When are you gonna When are you gonna have that thing where it's like stamped out, where I can put it on the shelf? You know. Well, I need to just hammer down it and just get on it and get it finished. And I, like I said, during the pandemic, so many things have been happening. I've been so distracted, and a lot of the research that I've been doing, I've been doing overseas. Yeah. You know? and obviously, I just have to do my research remotely and get that book finished. <laughs> I have a whole lot now. I just need to actually type it. But I'm hoping, probably, maybe by the beginning of 2022, maybe January 2022. Oh wow! I'm hoping to get get it out there it's gonna be out well hopefully the, hopefully the lady doesn't come back before then <laughs> because if she does yeah. then your book is gonna change dramatically <laughs> oh my gosh and then in, the difficult thing is like the more research i do the more it changes and the more things i want to go back and add in previous chapters it's like this never ending i'm like oh this is so cool i gotta put this in here and it's just constant it's never ending because there's so many great things that tie into you know everything else that is already in the book so I get so excited about things. I get distracted and I want to go back and write about that. And then it's like, I never actually finished the entire thing, which I just need to do and then go back and add things. Well, you can but always have, you can have, you can always have a, a different edition, you know, the enhanced true. edition after it comes out, you know, you know, the, uh, the updated and enhanced edition. Yeah. And after I tell you, after sending all the Chris Bledsoe information, <laughs> you might have to add that in there. You yeah, know, I just might. It's, it's just it's amazing. Like the, the appearance. You know, I had like this, I think this this is in a whole, a, a Lawrence Gardner book. And it was something about the holy bloodline of Jesus Christ. Really great read. It, it, it's a totally different take on the bloodline and the traditions. But it talks about, oh man, I just kind of lost it. We're talking about, um, gosh. Oh yeah. Uh, no, it's okay. About adding, I just say about adding the Chris Bledsoe story about the lady and then adding, adding that whole story into oh, the Oh, yes. Seeing the white lady. So yes, it, uh, what I was thinking of was the Virgin of Guadalupe. Uh, there was a, a thing in there kind of talking about how this appearance of the Virgin or whatever was actually an appearance of the Magdalene. And it was talking about how through different generations that there was always, for example, we go back and we have a different gods and goddesses. Like we have Jesus and Mary Magdalene who mm-hmm. represent, you know, all the Osiris and Isis. They represent Yahweh and Ashtera. They represent all these different, you know, divine couples. But through the traditions or through each generation or through some kind of cycle, emerges a new Christ and Sophia, a new Jesus and Mary Magdalene, or a new Isis and Osiris that follows the tradition. It's like, that's part of the reason I think that Mary Magdalene was was veiled was because she was, you know, she was to be protected because she was the royal wife, the royal in- incarnation of Sophia, and of the goddess. And that being said, she if she is the only one that can carry on that bloodline of Christ, then yeah, she needs to be protected, or of God in general. I mean, I guess if, if they are you know, that incarnation that is God. And that is a reason to keep track of a bloodline. But I think that the, it talks about in the Gardner book, getting back to my point, it talks about that the, the Virgin of Guadalupe was actually like the, that current in that time period, that incarnation of Magdalene. Right. Because she was wearing, she was wearing green and red and white or something like that. And that's what the Magdalene's always depicted wearing. Yeah, that's what that's what my always uh, when I was getting into it like Fatima, it came to like and the white buffalo calf woman and then the, the lady that came saw Chris Bledsoe and like you know all these different apparitions you know Guadalupe all these things, um, it presents itself to you in a way that you can understand it. Yeah, Be- because Chris, what Chris, and the thing with Chris is that he's not Catholic, you know, so he just he, mm-hmm. he doesn't know about the I mean the Virgin Mary you know he knows but it's not as as prominent in the Catholic religion right for him so it's like yeah. It, it didn't ring a bell. I mean, whereas like somebody who's a devout Catholic would have saw that and been like, oh, it's the Virgin Mary. Same thing with right. Fatima, you know, it's like, oh, these kids are, you know, Catholic. That's all they know. It's like, oh, it's the Virgin Mary. When it could be, it's the same entity or spirit, whatever you want to call it throughout history, but in, in, in a way that it makes sense to you. I don't know if that, that's kind of, yeah. that's, that's my interpretation. The same thing with the white buffalo calf woman. It's just, you know, the white buffalo calf woman. It makes sense because it's a white you know, a glowing white lady is. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And that's kind of one of the reasons I started having feelings, this connection that she had to the Magdalene, whether it was just a spiritual connection, because that spirit that, you know, the divine feminine in essence, the goddess is Sophia in all forms, whether you say it's the Virgin Mary or it is Magdalene or the white Buffalo calf woman, or however you recognize and call her, it's still Sophia, the goddess, mm-hmm. or you know, on the other hand, you have this divine entity that appears to you a different a god by any different name. It's all the same deity mm-hmm. when it goes when it you know comes down to it. We have different names in different places, and we see them because we imagine them in different ways. But they really are the same. 
and, and that's another thing is people, when I say that I'm interested in the goddess, they'll be like, well, which one? And I'm like, well, <laughs> part of it, it's all deity. It's all goddess. It's, it's all the same thing. It's just how different people perceive it. Yeah. And it's like same thing with religion. You know, some Christ- Christians, some t- but the timeless war between Islam and Christianity, <laughs> but we're yeah. both praying to the same God. Allah is the same God that Christians pray to and vice versa. It's amazing. So, I, yeah. It is the same spirit, I think, when it, when it really comes down to it, because it's the divine feminine and the divine masculine, the, the center, the beginning of life itself. Yeah. Maybe it's actually the feminine that's beginning, but the masculine part. Uh, yeah. Anyways. No, I think you're right. <laughs> I think you're right. So how well, do you, then, how do you think? Concept, I'm really... No, go ahead. I'm sorry. How do I think what? Well, I was just oh, going to say. Okay. How... So I was just going to talk about. <laughs> How do, how do what? Well, I was just going to say, how do you think Freemasonry and the Templars play play the, the role that they do now and then? Like, what what do you think the current role is for the Templars and the Masons and the historic one? I, I think that a lot of Masons join Freemasonry to be social and to have buddies and to say they're a Mason. There you go. And there is a select few that are really interested in serving the purpose and really carrying on the tradition and really diving into the mysticism, the the tradition, the the symbolism. I mean, Venus and a lot of the degrees of Freemasonry, Venus and the goddess are at the at the heart of it. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of Freemasons, I've talked to Freemasons. I was about this that had no idea. I was on a plane going to Scotland and I was sitting next to this dude that I talked his ear off the whole flight from Dallas to London. <laughs> and uh, we were talking about this kind of stuff because he was a Mason and he had no idea about <laughs> any of it. And I just and he's from England. And so we got into this and I'm like, oh man, I'm sitting here schooling him on Freemasonry and he's a Mason or uh, some of the traditions associated, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just amazing to me that some people join this and they don't really have any, you know, desire to really learn what's at the core of it all. And right. that's disappointing to me. But of course, there are some people that really do join to learn and really want to help preserve that tradition and help keep it alive. And, you know, it, it's it's just like there's a select few of people that really know a, a lot of what's going on because right. there's so much that is hidden from from the public from most people and certain people and certain traditions are trusted with this knowledge or trusted right. with certain documents or artifacts and i think today there are some people that are still really carrying on that tradition and maybe doing part of what they were doing before but i think that that purpose was to protect certain traditions and to honor them whether it might be about the bloodline uh, i think the templars we're trying to establish a new Jerusalem in America. I think that was their purpose at the time. They were trying to ret- retrieve certain things from the Holy Lands that they right. could bring and establish a new Jerusalem here mm-hmm. with. And I think that's what their purpose was. And then the founding fathers did just that. So I think they were carrying on that exact purpose. Haley, you're awesome. I'm so and happy so that you know all this today, stuff. I don't know what the purpose No, that's it. <laughs> I mean, in my I mind, say, anyway, I was like... <laughs> That's yeah. that's what I think it is totally. But I mean, today I, I couldn't really say. Like, no, you're right. There's a there's a handful of I us. Mean, I mean, today it's just people. yeah. There's a handful of us that that get in. Like you said, there's the majority of us are just gonna like go out to dinner and you know hang out with guys that they you know and make friends. But there's a core group of 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 guys that are that get it, and and that's not a very big group of people at all. And um, you know, now luckily, you got me thinking. I'm like thinking today. What, what's the purpose of today? You know, right. because if we've already established this America, what's the next step now? Now, what's the purpose? Is it just carrying on those traditions and the knowledge that we already had? Or is there something new that we're working towards? Yeah, those, those are great questions. I think there's always that ever expanding quest for knowledge. You know, um, I belong to a, um, a, right. a thing called the S, uh, um, SRICF. So uh, there's a Rosicrucian branch. It's the um, branch of Freemasonry. So it's a Christian Rosicrucian branch of Freemasonry, or ICF. There's only about 4,000 of us on the planet. And I didn't know it was real until I was asked to join. And I was like, wow. And I'd been in Freemasonry for years. When I met these guys, I was like, where the hell have you been? It was a lot of the times it was guys that we'd, I'd have these conversations that I'm having with you and they would look at me like I was, <laughs> you know, what are you talking about, man? Yeah. I, I can't figure this out, right? But these guys, it's just like, they get it, you know, and, and they're on that higher quest. It's, you know, it's actually called a college. So we, you know, write papers, we do lectures, you know, we learn, that's the whole thing about all this, you know, all these ideas and all this, a lot of it's been 
you know, it's protected history or protected knowledge, you know, that we, we keep and we entrust yeah. with each other, right? So that, that it keeps going and it doesn't die and it doesn't go away. So I think there's that. I mean, I don't know if it's just like um, there's that, but, you know, there's a lot of great things that come out of masonry. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's a little uh, at the top that I don't know about, but the guys that I met with and the guys that I do I'm involved with now, I mean, some of the things that I've learned about and then the ideas that we share and the way we, you know, do research together is just profound. It's just amazing. And that's kind of what I was looking for when I got into masonry. But yeah, if I didn't, if I wouldn't have got into that, it would have just been like, Hey, we're going to have the, uh, pancake breakfast next Sunday, you know, and it's, that's just kind of what's going on. But <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah they talk about the divine feminine. Most of them be like, what have you got in your coffee, buddy? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of the, the sad thing is like, people join it, but they, and for me being a part of something like that, are you, so talking, you're talking about, um, the order that you're in, are yeah. you familiar with Tim Hogan's Collegia? No, I'm not. Tim Hogan's, what was it called again? No. Okay. Do you, are you, you're familiar with Grandmaster Tim Hogan? Yes. No. Tim Hogan. No? Nope. Okay. Oh my gosh. You gotta go look up Tim Hogan. He's a, he's a good friend of mine. We're actually planning a tour we, that we had to reschedule from December to probably sometime this fall. We're trying to figure out the dates now, but it's going to be a, a tour to Mexico and it's the exploration of the Kabbalah traditions within ah, Mayan culture. Nice. That's very cool. Yeah. So we're, we're working on that. And grand, uh, Grandmaster Tim Hogan is the Grandmaster of multiple different orders, but you should definitely check him out. He's written some books. Uh, I'll Maybe I could bring you into the Templar Collegia. It's really cool. And it's basically cool. just sharing knowledge and uh, wisdom and, you know, learning. And they, I know we're having a get together in person finally this fall. Oh, right. Which will be great in Colorado and Denver. Yeah. So, but anyway, no, he, um, he is, he's gotten some really great material written that I think you would really enjoy. Uh, so yeah, something to look into. And then yeah. where were we going after that? We were talking about, I don't know. <laughs> I was just saying how it, how it tied into the, to the divine feminine, the lady. And like, I think it's there. And like you said, the Venus and you oh, know, like, nobody even knows. Yeah. yeah. Right. It, it's just, no, it's amazing to me that so many people don't see that aspect of it. No, no, it's right there in front of them the whole time. You know, it's hidden in plain sight. Yeah. I mean, in, you know, for me, when I became a Freemason and all the things that I'd seen my whole life, I was like, ah, all this stuff starts making sense now. All the symbology, all the way, all these buildings, like all of the, you know, everything, even the stars above me, you know, all of this stuff makes way more sense now. It's like clicked, but some people just don't get it. Yes. Yes. And so, you know, for so many reasons, there's like all these connections, these things about Mary Magdalene and Jesus, and you could also go back and say Isis and Osiris and all the other divine couples that were, you know, God and goddess. One of the things I found interesting, um, this is kind of random, but the Telpiot tomb, do you know much about the Telpiot tomb? I don't. Okay, so actually a tomb that has been said to be the royal tomb of Jesus and his family. And it's uh -huh. a, you know, ongoing archeological- Oh, there's a triangle there above several, the top of it. I yes. did see this, yes. yes, okay, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. And so um, also in there, one of the tombs was Mary Omne, the Mar or something to that effect. Mary Omne Mar, some, something like that. And obviously Mar has to do with the ocean and the waters because in France, there's all these things dedicated to Mary of the sea. And it's the same thing, Mary, uh, you know, all that, that it's real, the connection between Mary Magdalene and the ocean is very strong, especially in France. And so if that was her title and she was called that, no wonder why all these people, you know, associated her with these different, you know, there's so many baths or I'd say baths, like public ba beach areas that are on the rivers and these baths, the, the springs that you can go bathe in that were considered sacred, like in the south of France or everywhere because Mary Magdalene allegedly had come there. But um, going back to the Talpiot tomb, the interesting th thing to me about the Amine was that if you look at the tradition of um Amun and Amun Ra in mm -hmm. Egyptian mythology or theology, whatever you want to call it. Uh, his consort was Amenet, mm -hmm. A M E N E T. But the French pronunciation of that is Amene. So you have Mary Amene in the Tapiat tomb. And to me, it was just further evidence that Mary Magdalene was literally the incarnation of the mystery god Amun's wife, Amenet, Amene. Mm -hmm. So that, that was kind of an interesting find. I'm kind of like, hmm, is this a coincidence? Probably not, because it never is, but it was, it was a cool <laughs> find for sure. And I think that tradition of the the couple, the divine couple being the sun and Venus constantly following each other is really important. 
And we have even, even in astronomy, you have these constellations, like we end the age of Pisces and Jesus was always associated with the fish. You know, the fish. He was the fisher king. Yeah. And so when he dies, then physically in the, well, in the story, we don't know if it was physically, but in, in the story, in the Bible, it says he dies. And then he appears to Mary Magdalene and basically says, continue on my teachings. And then it's her time to shine. Right. Whereas when the, the age of Pisces ends, now Aquarius begins and it's the time for the grail bearer or Mary Magdalene, the divine feminine to, t to shine. And so you can look at it from a small scale, like in the Bible of that specific story, but also on the grand scheme of things, because Mary Magdalene, her, her symbol in the heavens is for one Venus, the planet, but the constellation she's associated with is Aquarius. And maybe that's why she's also called the grail bearer. You are amazing. <laughs> You put a lot Thank of this you. together. That's awesome. And you put it together really well that it's easy for people to follow. You know, sometimes you get into some of these things and it's like really, yeah. really hard, but you, I mean, you can just have a good conversation and we, I mean, it's just really easy to follow and it, it makes sense and it's exciting. I really appreciate your work. It's awesome. Thank you so much. Seriously. Thank you so much. And I, I feel like there are so many little parts and different puzzle pieces like this. This is just a minor thing. It's not like some big, you know, revelation or anything, but there's so many minor things like that, that when you kind of think about it in a different way, it starts to make sense. Like, I don't know why this, this was the case or, you know, why it was this way, but it also makes me wonder, you know, going back to, I was talking about maybe there are different generations or different time periods when, um, because the, the, and going back to seeing the Virgin of Guadalupe and what Gardner said in his book, he basically says that the vision of Guadalupe was not just a vision, but that she was actually there. And the same thing I was going to mention about white buffalo calf woman. We don't uh, know for sure because things like playing the game whisper, pho not yeah. whisper, phone. When, phone when tag. Yeah. The free sound, yeah. And you, you get something completely different at the end of it. So you put, you know, a thousand or 2000 or more years in the mix and who knows what we have now. And so white buffalo calf woman, actually that she appeared about 2000 years ago because they talked about the sacred bundle and, you know, when the sacred bundle was given and it was about 2000 years ago, about in the right time frame for it to be Mary Magdalene, you know? So I think it's possible that she could have been the one that appeared to them. And, you know, who knows who, who it was that appeared as the, you know, maybe it wasn't an appearance of an apparition. Maybe it was a physical appearance of an actual person. Right. And I think you, in your book as well said that, um, the person who holds the ceremonial pipe, the red pipe, um, yeah, it's sacred like bundle. Sacred bundle. Seven. It's like the seventeenth generation or something like that. Oh, no, it's the twentieth. We're almost. I think maybe it's the nineteenth, and we're almost at the twentieth. And to the Native American culture, each generation is about one hundred years. years right. About the two thousand years passing, nearly, because that would be around the right time frame. That makes sense. So it's. I think we're. I think time's up. <laughs> I think if I, if I do my math right, I think we're uh, we're real close for that thing to happen again. So, and you know, maybe she came to Chris Bledsoe. Maybe she's coming to people all over. And I, and I don't think it's just one or two people. I don't. I think that she's probably following people that have some type of bloodline relation that has before. We talked about this earlier on. Mm -hmm. Feel safe with that you can relate to. I mm -hmm. think the, I think the, I think the blood sows have Scotch, Scott Irish, um, history. I think that, um, you know, something that, uh, I think they're looking into it now, but, um, I think that there's probably a tie to all that because of the connection to the earth and, you know, you feel safe, right? Like you said, you go out to North Dakota, eh, nothing's going to bother you here. You're just going to hang out, you know? Yeah. You know where you feel safe. And I think spirits are definitely drawn to, you know, the places and people that they are familiar with, whether that's the blood or the location, or maybe it's both, who knows. But I think that's definitely a, a good start to diving into that and where where that spirit might appear next. I mean, it's just so fascinating to me that now we're in a time when people are starting to have visits from these orbs, these apparitions, and the white lady herself. Maybe yeah. she's going to start appearing to more of us, like you said. I mean, I think all everything that we, we have been going through as you know, uh, this whole world, this whole, this entire earthly community has been going through in the last few years. It definitely has felt like something out of the book of Revelation. So <laughs> doesn't it, it though? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it wouldn't surprise me that for, in order for one, you know, era to end or for one era to begin, one has to end. So I think that we're at that point where it's going to be a turning point and we are turning towards something better. All this destruction and pain and suffering has had to happen for the you know to be able to begin something new it's like tarot when you get the death card in tarot it's not necessarily a bad thing it means that there's rebirth on the way right yeah so yeah. i think it's the same thing in reality too you have to have some, one thing to end for another to begin and maybe we're looking at that turning point where we go back to the divine feminine and she you know helps heal us and helps us get back to where we should be
Oh my God, that's perfect. I mean, from what you know, Chris was saying that the, the the lady said was that you know she's the protector, she's the mother, she's the healer, she's you know yeah. she's the comforter, she's there that she's all and you know this is really cool from a lot of things he said. You know, he's had some regressions, obviously, and things, and um, you know that she's always here. They're, they've never left. She's always been around us. We just need to call to her. Her and her mm-hmm. angels are always here. You, got, you know, the angels, right. the angels, they're always, they're always here. And then you think about that and you know, they're orbs and then that turns into UFOs and it's like, why, wow, is that the connection? Are they the watchers? Are they, are they always here? Are they connected to, they care about us more than we care to interact with them? You know, do we just need to open the door and say, Hey, cool. Thanks. I believe in you. You're here. Yeah. I'm ready to have the conversation. Let's hang out. You know, I think, I think really think that's it. I think that's more of people like you and I talking about this, your book, obviously, you know, me and my dumb YouTube channel, you know, just to get out and get information out and, you know, meet people and, and share this stuff and get it out there. I think it's totally part of the whole thing. Um, no, absolutely. It's, this is all, you know, we're all doing the good work here and doing our part, you know, to enlighten others and to help get them. I think a, a big part of it too is energetically, it's, it's such a, it, energy is such an important thing. Yeah. If you're not energetically in the space to accept that and to be open to that kind of energy that, that, that Sophia brings us, that the divine feminine brings us, then you're just not going to have it. It's like, you know, people that want to see spirits, but they're not, they, they don't open their energy to that. You have to be on that frequency and in the right mental and spiritual space to have those experiences. And once you like meditation is so important, you know, for that reason, when you're trying to have experiences with the divine, with deity, you have to be in the right space to do it. And yeah. so I think if more people really detach themselves from technology and from all the everyday craziness and focused on the spiritual stuff, I think that we'd be a lot more um, functional society and we'd be in a much better place. You know, we wouldn't have all the crazy drama in the world happening that we do now. Yeah. And I think we're on the way back to that. I, I really do hope so. I really do. I mean, it's, you know, it's hard for me to, I, I try to meditate, I, I, you know. I can. It's just, it's hard for me, but you know, it's, um, you know, and I, like I, I think a lot of it's self-induced too, because you know, no lie, I've said this a lot in, 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 a, in a bunch of my videos, but when I was younger, I would see spirits, I would see ghosts and you know, up into my teens, you know, early twenties, I would see things and it would scare me. You know, it's, it just too, you know, it was too much. And I met a lady named Chris Woodyard, um, who wrote a bunch of books called haunted Ohio. It was a haunted Ohio series. She's got like 10 of them now or whatever awesome lady i was at working at radio at the time and she came in during halloween and we're doing like the whole ghost thing you know and i was actually having experiences downtown dayton at this building that was 1800 slaughterhouse they turned into like a, a radio like a five-story radio station but it was like where the train would come in and cars you know full of cattle and they would just kill cattle, you know chop them up and whatever you know it was like a a big thing but i saw this entity all the time it was this dark entity and it was always there and it was just you know i've had so you saw, you saw yeah, a dead cow outside or something you know, like or? people like i was the dark oh, okay. spirits and like you know i was sleep paralysis and things happening in the building to me at times and oh, uh, you know i was by oh, her okay. go ahead i'm sorry i was gonna say so if they were slaughtering cattle if that's the bad thing that was happening there then what energy do you think would have been left from the people i don't know to me it, it seemed like uh it was like more like slave type time. So there was more like a, it wasn't necessarily, you know, it was, there's probably some really bad other things going on there as well. It wasn't just, sense, yeah. you know, cause I did see something like that, you know, um, 1700s, mm-hmm. 1800s, like, but, um, you know, I talked to her about like off the air, just her and I in this room and I'm like, Hey, you know, I've been doing, you know, I, and you know, I was young and she's like, look, you can turn it off. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, if you don't want to see it anymore, just turn it off. And I go, you just can't, I go, like a switch she's like yeah you just turn it off i'm like okay she's like if you don't want to see it just when you see it or whatever just tell it to go away and you're done you just don't want to see it anymore and I'm like that's that easy she's like yeah so i was like okay you know i'm like 20 19 i'm like all right cool <laughs> screw off dude like i don't want to see it anymore whatever and like for the longest time i didn't have any experiences anymore it was you know it was like a switch and it's just that i got the older that i got the more i, I was open to it to be like oh, okay you know i'm not as scared you know i'm not as bothered by it or you know whatever else i know it's not going to kill me and no it's not going to you know the horror movies isn't real going to happen you know it's not going to come at me with a knife in the middle of the night you know like you know i can accept for accept it for what it is and open myself up to it and it, it's take it's been a lot harder to turn the switch back on than it was to turn it off that is so interesting you say that because i literally have had the exact same experience you know i think i was i think i might have been 16 or i think i was 16 or 17 when i started having just like i mean i'd always kind of had those experiences but at that point it was constant every night i'd be waking up i'd see things i would have these energies like you know sleep paralysis i would right. wake up and i'd see somebody on my chest or something you know i went through a period of time where it was just like hyper i was so hypersensitive to to 
different Everything. spirits. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. It draws me. And I'm like, go away. I just want yeah. peace. So I'd gone to somebody locally and talked to her about it and who, you know, did spiritual work. And I, she was actually a holistic healer. And I talked to her about it. I said, I feel crazy. I just feel insane. And I just want this to stop. I want it to stop. I want peace. I want to sleep. And <laughs> it's scaring me. And, you know, all of that. And she, she told me, she's like, well, just turn it off. But the yeah. same thing that you saying and i'm like well i can do that and she said well, of course you can <laughs> yeah. so I, I just didn't understand that you could do that really and I, it was so simple like you said and yeah it's harder to turn it back on but yeah. i will say one one more thing i know we're probably getting close to time but oh, yeah, that's okay. when i went to uh, roslyn castle for the first time back in 2019 i actually you can rent roslyn castle and it's what? the ruins that you see at the very end of da vinci code you can and, rent like at the very end yeah. So at the very end, you see, he walks up and says something to her. Um, Tom Hanks says something to Sophie. To, her name's Sophie. Go figure. Mm -hmm. Oh, figures. Uh, right. Yeah. Bloodline member. Right. And so they're just outside Rosalind Castle, but that's the ruin you see in the background. And she kind of, he makes a comment to her about, can she turn water into wine? And she dips her toe in the pond. It's not really actually there. They put it there for the movie, by the way. <laughs> and then she says, no, not yet. Or no, something like that. But that is Rosalind Castle. And I rented that and you can rent it. It I had no idea. It's not advertised because it's still used as the family home. The Earl of Roslyn and his wife still go and stay there for time periods, you know? So it's their personal home that you can actually rent. It's like an Airbnb. You can Airbnb the Roslyn castle. Practically. Practically. <laughs> so what do I do? I go and I, you know, rent it for like three nights and four days alone. <laughs> so I'm staying in this like castle alone. All by yourself. And, <laughs> hey, Haley, that's so not a myself. good idea. I don't know. That's not a good idea. <laughs> well, I could lock I, there. It was cool. They give you like an actual key and it's like a big castle key, you know? And I'm like, oh, that's cool. And so you get to lock yourself in at night. And so that's what I did. And I was just surrounded by the castle walls. And, uh, you know, the, the lady that gave me the key up at the chapel had told me, you know, there's a story about a white lady that appears to people. And, um, of course, she said the white lady can be heard singing at midnight. And she, she sings a song about where the treasure of Rosalind is buried. And she said, so if you, if you're up at midnight, listen for her to sing. Well, so I wait up and, you know, I turn off all the lights and I'm going to bed and I'm kind of terrified because <laughs> I'm thinking things, like imagining things. And, you know, what did I just hear? Do I hear singing? Is that not singing? And then I start hearing something else entirely. And I start hearing the sound of like metal clinking and screaming and shouting. And I'm like, what am I hearing? And it wasn't coming from in the castle. It was coming from outside, just down in Roslyn Glen on the, ri in the river, like in the river area. So I'm thinking, what is going on? And I thought, maybe it's like a bunch of teenage kids getting into trouble and getting drunk down there or something, you know, that's the only, right. fighting. I, that's the only thing I could think of. Well, you know, it kept me up for about maybe an hour. And then finally I had taken some, you know, night, you know, nighttime sleep pills to knock myself <laughs> out. And I was, I was gone. I was in dream world. But the next morning I got up and I went for a walk through Roslyn and I was walking down this path and there is a memorial to the battle of Roslyn. And so I started reading it and it turns out that, you know, I think it was in 1302 or 1303. It was in the early 1300s. One of the Scottish independence wars was uh, during the Scottish independence wars, the battle of Roslyn took place. And it was a really interesting story because actually there was only 5,000 Scots and there was something like 25,000 Brits Whoa. that, you know, came and were defeated by the 5,000 Scots, even Whoa. though they were outnumbered. You're never going to guess how this war got started. It was actually, or this battle got started actually over a Ramsey woman from down the road at Dalhousie Castle. <laughs> and yeah. And I thought, well, this is fitting. So I started reading this. I thought, you can't make this up. You know, I'm reading, I'm like, I'm, I'm reading this and it's talking about how this lady, Margaret Ramsey from Dalhousie was in love with Sir, it was, it was a St. Clair. I think it was a William St. Clair, but she was in love with St. Clair and he was equally infatuated with her and at the same time, there was another person that was madly in love with Lady Margaret Ramsay. That was the, I think, the governor, the commander of the Edinburgh, Edinburgh, yeah, Edinburgh Castle. I think he was the governor or something like that. Oh, anyway, so he was the the British, the English post there at the time. Oh, of and course. He really wanted to marry Margaret Ramsay, and so he'd go over to Dalhousie Castle, the castle I was telling you that I stayed in for several months that helped me with my tour company. Um, <laughs> he had gone over there and would wine and dine them. And, you know, try to win over Lady Margaret Ramsey, but her heart was with the St. Clair. So oh, one day, wow. St. Clair, I want to say it was William, but I can't remember for sure. But he proposes to Lady Margaret and she says yes. And I think that same day when they're announcing their proposal, she actually knights him at Roslyn. There's a big ceremony for it. So Lady Margaret Ramsey knights him. So this gets back to the Englishman. And he was, his name was John something. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a very 
Yeah. So John Smith. <laughs> no, I'm trying to think. It was not a remarkable name, but it wasn't great either. I can't think of it off the top of my head. But in any case, he finds out and he is so angry that this woman that he loves has, you know, promised herself to the St. Clair, to the Scotsman, you know. And so he writes to the King of England and asks for permission to march on Scotland. So he the king grants it. He says, sure, go on. You know, so they go out. <laughs> they go out in three different places. There's three different armies. So they have an army going over to Roslyn. Yeah. And then they have an army going to Dalhousie Castle. And then they have an army going, I think, to the west and somewhere west. And they are aware because people have written back or the writers have come back and said, we see them coming. You know, this is what's going on. Blah, right. blah, 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 blah. We had some time to, to, you know, prepare for this. And so the St. Clair is having the close ties to the Templars wrote to one of the, or wrote over and asked one of the veterans of the Holy Wars, a Templar veteran, to help them out. And so he was over, and I don't think it's there anymore, the, the priory that he was at, but he takes some of his men and he goes over to join the St. Clairs. And he says, here's some Templar battle tactics from you know, the Holy Wars. Yeah. And so they use some of those strategies to help defeat the Brits, the English. And so when the English march on them, and there's this really cool story about how the prior the, the Templar veteran had taken everybody up on this hill just across from Roslyn and they, they lit up this fiery cross that you could see from Roslyn Castle. And the, he was giving them this pep talk about how they're going to defeat, you know, the English and it's God's, you know, it, that's what it's God's plan that they're going to win this. And it's in the divine plan. He's hyping them up about this, this battle and telling them they're going to win. And then they see this fiery cross, you know, out in the distance, which is kind of, kind of intense. But uh, when the English get there, they're defeated. So there's about 5,000 Scots, about 25,000 English people. And somehow they managed to defeat them. They know the terrain, you know, they have the advantage of the battle tactics of the right. Templars. And, uh, yeah. So only 10% of the English people walked away from that battle. Wow. And one of the people that survived, but was captured was the Englishman that had been in love with Lady Margaret Ramsay. So obviously the St. Clair had him ransomed back to the English, you know, English crown. And that they got married and lived happily ever after at Roslyn. So that was one of my ancestors. <laughs> that the, the battle was fought over. I thought that was pretty neat. And I thought when after I read that, I'm like, oh, I got chills down my spine. And I thought, you know what? I you didn't heard hear that kids last night. I heard the battle that was fought over one of my ancestors. That probably my ancestors from Dalhousie fought into the other Ramses and St. Clairs. You know, I just thought that was really amazing. It's like you. It's like I swear that your DNA is connected that way like somehow Absolutely. that like you have like you have ancestral memories and I, there was something disproven about it recently about um ancestral trauma and ancest ancestral memories being t passed down because trauma from your ancestors literally there was some article i was reading about this that they've proven that trauma from past you know from ancestors can affect you in this lifetime yeah well I, I think it was like seven generations believe it or not is it, I think it's gone back. I think you can, well, after seven generations, it's an inherited trait. I know that, which is crazy, yeah. right? So like seven generations yeah. back, if like your grandpa got bit by a spider and, it, and then his arm fell off, like you, you're, you're scared of spiders for the rest of your life. Like, that's it. You're done. <laughs> like if it goes yeah. back, so like that, you know what I mean? That That's kind of how that's, yeah. that's how that length goes. But yeah, ancestor DNA goes back. And I've said this in a couple of things before and I hate saying it, but that's the way I felt. I love my daughter to death. I would have never, ever do anything there, you know, uh, to say this, but I, I, I've said this before, but before I had her, I always thought that um, the DNA of all my ancestors was, was with me. If I procreated, my DNA would still be here and I'd be tied to earth and here again. But if I didn't, yeah. I could go back. And that was my ticket back. So yeah, if I... If, so if I didn't do it, I was like, eh, I'm free. I get to go back and I'm not tied here anymore. Like I said, I love my yeah. daughter completely. I would never change it again for the, you know, the planet. But I was like, that was my theory. And I don't know where I came up with that. It just came to me when I was like, well, if I don't have any kids, I don't have to stay here. Like, I, you know, my DNA is done. I'm gone. I'm out, you know, but yeah. uh, <laughs> like, and go back and hang out. But like, no, I, I wouldn't change it at all. But, the, but I was just a weird thing that I've always felt. And I don't know. Seems odd. It was in, in doing my genealogy. It was really odd that my on, on my mother's side um, there was four or five sisters, and only one out of the five got married and had kids. All the rest of them, they called them old mates. They never got married, never had kids. Really, that is interesting. Really weird. I, I yeah. My, so I guess if, if you hadn't had kids, then 
and it, because of that, because of the mitochondrial DNA, right? Because before in my mind, I was yeah. like, well, you know, you know, I'm the last of my name um, that I know of because I don't have any. There's no males anymore from the Majorowski side. Mm-hmm. And that yeah. was, was a big deal because my wife was like upset. She's like, "Oh, we had a you know we had a daughter," and I'm like, hey, you know, I was like, "Ah, the family." Name. But now that I know, I mean, it doesn't fucking it doesn't matter at all. Yeah. Yeah, the DNA is there, you know. Right. Stay there forever, but I don't know. I know this is late, and we went way over. But dude, this has been really awesome. Thank you so no, so awesome. much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh my god, can we talk again sometime? Seriously, this has been rad. Please, please, I would love to. I'm sure there'll be plenty more to talk about. Oh yeah, I know. When when the wife and I come to Scotland, we'll have to do like an on location. <laughs> yes, that would be so much fun. I would love to do that. But and you the, know, I've always thought about starting like a video blog or doing things like that at different sites. But I just when I'm there and I'm at a site like that, I just I'm enjoying it so much. I just never think to do something like that. No, totally. I mean, when you're in the moment, I think there's this ought to be said that it's like the the guy that's like videotaping the concert in front of you on his phone, and he's like, yeah, it's like, dude, enjoy. Like you're here, enjoy it. You know. I mean, cool, yeah. because I couldn't make the concert. And I'm, I'm really thankful for the guy who did that, that I'm watching. But like the yeah. guy that's there, you know what I mean? The guy yeah. that's there, that like, that's his job. Like, that's what he's doing. Like, dude, enjoy the moment. And I really think, but maybe you can do like the both. Maybe somehow there could be the best of both worlds. Because I think there's so many people that can't afford to go there, you know, won't be able to, you know, no. travel and things like that, that would probably really enjoy the experience, especially your experience, because of all the things that you're experiencing when you're there and be able to convey that and you do it so well. And I think that'd be awesome. So, dude, I, I think just keep doing what you're doing and and thank you so much for like uh spending your time with me and and chatting with all this stuff and and uh i I, nothing but love and hopefully this book skyrockets and and your future is amazing and hopefully i get to ride those coattails one day and be like i know i knew her i know that girl she's awesome thank you i hope so too i hope i can just buckle down and get this book done because that's what i really need to do and uh yeah we gotta definitely we gotta think about doing those tours and maybe even do like on location you know videos like you were talking about that'd be super cool someday yeah. your wife and i can bought under her you know outlander and how you know handsome jamie fraser is oh and- my god i gotta hear about that more she wants me to so like <laughs> I, got, I got friends that i talk to from england now and then she's just like you know she'll stop what she's doing she's like what just listen to their accent and then she we have she's yeah. Pel- she's peloton you know so she's like now she just all she does is listen to Brit- the guys with english accents <laughs> and peloton. Oh. And i'm like well i can't blame her, but i definitely have to say you know i prefer the scottish accent over the english any day <laughs> i agree there you go uh, no i you know uh, she's not gonna get me to do it <laughs> <It's all time. laughs> it would be horrible and just a crappy rendition of it so i'm not gonna go yeah, there yeah. That way. yeah but you know what it just dawned on me you were talking about the burning cross that was in one of the outlander things didn't jamie like burn yes. a big cross on a thing and like and to yes. get everybody yes. ready for the yeah yeah he did the exact same thing yeah so when they were going to retrieve claire after she'd been taken he said yeah. you know this is war and that's when he burns the fiery cross he said he wouldn't burn it again unless it was time for war and so right. that's he that and hyped everybody up for it that's exactly what he did yeah. same thing but that was the tradition going back they didn't always burn crosses sometimes it was a cross sometimes they would burn like wooden you know for ceremonies they would burn different things or for before wars they might burn an animal you know not not a real animal but like an effigy like, of you know, an animal like a like a deer yeah. or something yeah. or like yeah, yeah. there was a tradition of burning the stag you know oh, they got, did that yeah. a lot yeah so that kind of thing but that's that's a, an interesting point i haven't made that connection they they did do that in outlander too that's really cool yeah see my wife, my wife better listen to some of these every once in a while. She has a big influence. She doesn't even know. <laughs> yeah. Haley, so have you guys asked to ask one more question? Did yeah, yeah, you yeah. guys watch the show Men in Kilts that has the actors from Outlander in it? No, no, I haven't yet. I, I told her we should watch it. And it was just, you know, she was like, ah, what is it? I go, I think it's just the actors hanging out, going through Scotland, right? I think that's the premise yeah, of it, right? Yeah, so they're definitely just, you know, traveling around Scotland, drinking whiskey, finding trouble, learning about history and doing different things and having a blast. The episodes were only 30 minutes each, so you really don't have to commit for too long. I wish they were longer because right when you get into it, they're ending. Uh, but I'm hoping, I am hoping that I can do something with them potentially on a, you know, Outlander tour. Nice. You know, I'm trying to work on that because I think it would, they wanted, they, in their, they wrote a book called clan lands. And in the book, they talk about, you know, starting a tour company, but they don't uh, have the time to do it. And, hmm, well, huh, huh, so, uh, somebody who's already uh, spent some time and that uh, kind of came up with it then. Yeah. So I don't that know. That'd be, be really fun if it, if it worked out, but I am putting together outlander tours that hopefully I can start doing, you know, in 2022. So Dude, that's gonna really be, fun regardless. 
that's going to be so rad. I know we're going to probably be the first tour. I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> please, please. Because <laughs> I'm because I, I love it enough, but I'm still disconnected enough that I could be the videographer. I could be like, okay, cool, yeah. what? <laughs> and then when we get to the Templar side. I can just give the camera over to somebody else and be like, okay, now I'm paying attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, yes. And there's just so many more sites like that once once I started really diving into it, there's so many sites that are not talked about for being Templar sites. Like, for example, I got a shout out to um, one of my good friends, at Peter, and Peter runs the Mary Cooter House in Scotland, and it's in Aberdeen on the East Coast. And Mary Cooter House is actually a 12th century Knights Templar preceptory. Wow. One of two... You know, Preceptories in Scotland. The other one is Belantradoc or Temple Church down in Midlothian, down by Roslyn. Mm -hmm. That's like, you know, in ruin now. Obviously, it doesn't exist anymore. But the Mary Cooter House, um, it's a very nice hotel now. And they've got great food. I've spent a lot of time there. And Peter and I are actually working on a, you know, tours together, incorporating both the Templars and the Jacobites. We didn't even get into the Jacobites and the Templars. And that's a whole other thing that's super interesting. Charles Edward Stewart himself was the Grand Master of the Knights Templar in Scotland. But um, oh. yeah, so the Mary Cooter house is really cool too. It's, it's a, I had no idea about it. I had read about, you know, Mary Cooter, but basically the way that the author had stated it in the books that I read was that it was in ruin, but it's a functioning luxury hotel. That you can go to right now. <laughs> and it's, it's awesome. Peter reached out to me because he saw one of my paid advertisements for my, you know, night on a girl quest tours on Facebook. And that's, that's how we got in touch and he invited me to come stay up there for a few days. And one of the workers even said to me, you know, Peter told us he met this girl on Facebook and invited her to come up here. And <laughs> <laughs> but now we're like this, we, you know, working together and it's great. I mean, the best connections are just totally random like that and by chance. So just like us. Scotland, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I'm really thankful for that. And um, I've got to tell you next time about what we did. We ended up having some really interesting paranormal experiences at the Templar Preceptory. Really? So let's talk about that next time. Definitely. Oh my God. Now I'm excited. Was there orbs? No. 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 I'm still excited. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, it was, it was really cool. It freaked out the staff. The staff was, the, it, it, Peter got the entire, um, you know, senior management team to come up there and be a part of it. And we went into the haunted room of Mary Cooter. If, if, uh, if you guys come to Scotland, we'll have to go and, you know, do like some ESP in the haunted room. The haunted room. Oh boy. That's all we need. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna move. We're gonna end up awesome. buying a castle in Scotland. I can see Please, it now. I want to so bad. I would love that. You can I, buy a Scott I, castle, can't you? You got to be able to. Can you? Can you yeah, buy land? Yeah. Can you buy that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, one hundred percent. You can buy castles and fix them up and all that stuff. And you know, actually, the other castle, Dalhousie Castle, was the original seat of Clan Ramsay in Scotland. But um, more recently, it was sold, and they bought Brecon Castle. That was the other family seat of uh, Clan Ramsay, <laughs> and so. Brecon Castle is a little bit further away. It's a little bit more northeast. And now the current Earl of Dalhousie, I believe, his name is Jamie also, Jamie Ramsey. And <laughs> of course his name is Jamie. <laughs> yeah. It's a very popular name there in Scotland, actually. There's so many people that know their name Jamie. It's unreal. But um, no, he is the he is the I'm losing my words. He is the clan chief. He is the clan chief of, you know, of Read the Ramsey clan and they live there at Brecon Castle, but it's for sale now because you know there's a lot of cost in running a massive castle like that, and they have a whole <laughs> staff and everything. So I guess if they sell the castle, the staff comes with it. I mean, I'd love to be waited on like that and have a whole staff to run my household, but um, maybe one day we can buy it back for Clan Ramsey. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tours so, tour will be successful yeah. enough that you could do it. It'd be red. Yeah, I mean, there's castles for sale. Believe me, that one would just be like, I think it's like eight million pounds or something. So, kind of out of my price range for now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like sixteen million dollars, <laughs> something like that, something like absurd. Fourteen, fifty, yeah, something. I don't know. Maybe in Bitcoin, we can make it happen. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> thank you. For, thank you so much again. This has been so awesome. I mean, thank you for spending so much time with me, and you know. Thank you. Thank you again. I, I, I wish you the best and, and hopefully the book comes out and it's huge and your tours are, and everything and anything I can do to help. And please, please come back and hang out with me and talk to me some more. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you so much for having me on. It was a blast. Thanks.